declare the meeting open at four minutes past six. And I'd like to start by saying on behalf of the City of Vincent, I acknowledge the Wagtrek people of the Noongar Nation and I pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to welcome you, members of the Public Gallery, to the meeting this evening. Just to let you know that we do web stream our meeting, but we do not web stream the Public Gallery public question time part of the meeting. So at that time we do ask you to state some personal details, so just so you're aware they're not transmitted. Thanks. CEO, do we have any apologies? Is it just Councillor Gondoshevsky? Yes. Councillor Gondoshevsky is on an approved leave of absence and we'll be back at our next meeting. Um, so now it's public question time. You're welcome to come up to, count to the microphone to address Council for up to three minutes. We do ask that you state the item number to which you're speaking and your name and address. Um, and there's no set order, it's just whoever comes up first. So please, uh, first speaker, go ahead. Yes, please go ahead if you could, uh, the same as with public question time, if you can just state the item number in your name and address. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Sam Winfield and I'm speaking about uh, agenda item 9.3, the change of use from a shop to tavern uh, from 452 to 460 William Street. I'd just like to confirm with the Mayor how much time we have to speak in this deputation. Uh, technically 15 minutes, but I have asked um, if you could please be succinct given that we're drilling down to one particular planning matter and given that the council members have received a lot of written information. So if you could just bear that in mind, That's that fine. would be great. Thank you. Okay. So to the Mayor, the Council Executive and the elected members, I'd like to just start again by describing this project. This venue, or the proposed development, is a intimate 50 person neighbourhood wine store and bar. It's going to serve as takeaway and dine in natural, environmentally friendly and sustainable wines with locally sourced and wine inspired food. This type of venue is, or this type of wine sorry, is available in Sydney and Melbourne, each boasting about 30 plus venues and in Brisbane, Adelaide, Canberra and Geelong both boasting about five. Perth only has one venue that prescribes this kind of wine. It has to be referred to as a tavern only because of the rigid licence types that the Department of Racing and Gaming and Liquor impose. This venue doesn't resemble a tavern in almost any way. It is not a big beer barn for hundreds of people. It doesn't have pool tables, poker machines or cigarette machines. It is an intimate neighbourhood wine store. And I think that it's logical that all the development criteria that are imposed on taverns don't apply in this case. The store will operate during daytime hours, predominantly as a natural wine store, and then the evenings will also function as a small restaurant. It will be one of the smallest licensed venues in Perth. It will attract thoughtful clients and conscious wine lovers who are largely from the local area and who will walk or use ride-sharing services like Uber and Chauffeur. Economic planning and development firm Praxis conducted intercept surveys on William Street, revealing compelling evidence that the largest proportion of the customers will be from within 800 to 1500 metres of the store. I've been a resident in this area on Lake Street and Ruth Street for four years and know the venue, I know, that the, I know the area and know that this venue, an intimate neighbourhood wine store, is in keeping with the city's strategic vision and town planning scheme too. This building is going to be rezoned district centre and as a community focused and as a community focused point will employ local people bring vibrancy and safety to the streetscape uh, and bring to life a beautiful yet underutilized state and council heritage building and for these reasons i think it embodies everything the council is looking for the waiving of the substantial figure for cash in lieu of parking whilst it might seem a simple matter of policy implementation to me is a big deal and is a big deal to the viability of this project as a sole owner of this business, I'm trying to establish a small and independent business, not a large franchised multinational owned tavern. The issue is important to me and I would like to personally request you consider waiving this fee. It is not just based on the evidence that I've provided, but also I've engaged planning solutions and have asked Paul Kotsoglo to speak to outline the other important issues to support my request. Thank you for your time. Madam Mayor, councillors, uh, 
for the ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you know, my name's Paul Kotsoglo. I'm Managing Director at Planning Solutions. Thank you for taking the time to receive the emails. If you've had the chance to read them and some people have given me comments and feedback, I appreciate that. Um, we also received um, contact direct from the city's offices in response to those, and they've responded uh, very uh, promptly and transparently, and we'd appreciate, uh, we have appreciated that. Um, having said that, we are here to continue the discussion because there are some aspects that, um, having only been engaged on this on Sunday afternoon, uh, I haven't had a, 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 an immense amount of time to consider this. Um, but in doing so, um, we've looked at and reviewed very carefully the presentation um, made by uh, Dr William, Winfield and um, there are some aspects in terms of the assessment that we'd like to raise with the Council. First and foremost, what is being requested is permissible. That's most important. The application of policy um, is meant to guide decision making, but it isn't a hard and fast um, unequivocal rule. And that's uh, outlined in the case Clive Elliott Jennings and Co versus the WAPC, which I've referred to. The approach to be taken, though, is variations are meant to be applied cautiously and sparingly um, and for cogent, with cogent reasons. We consider we have those cogent reasons. Um, I'll start off with the simple one first. The train station. The train station is physically located um, where it is, 960 metres up the road and round the corner from this site. Having said that, that's if you walk out one end of the train station. If you are going to travel by public transport, you probably do what even I do today, which is use my smartphone, to find the smartest and quickest route there. The smartest and quickest route from the Perth train station, which is the destination that we take off from uh, on, on foot, takes us then to the Blue Cat bus service. It's a free service. It takes us up Beaufort Street. Two stops, we're at the central TAFE stop. It's a free service. I use it all the time in the city. And if I use it, I'm sure much younger people, conscious of uh, their community, will do so as well. So we say that on that basis, it is part of the service that you would use to make your way to this venue. We ask, therefore, that you take into account the final destination closest to William Street, which is therefore 560 metres from the site. And as a result, you would apply a, an adjustment factor of 1B, the 1B adjustment factor to this, which will bring the ultimate number down to $17,064. Uh, having said that, we submit there are good reasons. So we would ask if you are going to vary these standards, and um, I hadn't had the time to get back to the offices until late this afternoon, um, you'll see if you are going to consider this, we'd ask you to look at the uh, aerial photograph which shows the route, the blue route, the train station and the venue at the top of the page. We say though that the Council does have the ability to waive completely this requirement. And this is on the basis that there is a staffing strategy. Now, it is not something that's uh, um, nebulous. The staffing strategy has been carefully considered by the proponent, hasn't been part of the um, development application, but it is part of our presentation and um, uh, Dr Winfield is prepared to write and make it part of the application that he will, uh, where absolutely possible, well, where appropriate and uh, possible, he will employ local people within the 1.5 radius of the site because this is both good for his parking requirements and his staffing requirements. He can get people there quickly and easily. Look, um, this is a small-scale tavern. 
I know I'm on a limited time frame. I know you've seen most of this. Uh, this is a very sensible proposal. I should declare an impartiality interest because I'm about 450 metres from this place. I walked there on the weekend to see it. It is going to make good use, economic use, of a building that is constantly involving businesses that turn over and fail. If we impose onerous conditions on this development, more onerous than things like retaining the existing facade already, it will cause undue stress on the business. We ask Council to waive the requirement. We also, in the public consultation, received 11 letters of support. They were not procured by the applicant or anyone associated with this project. Those of you that have been in local government as long as you have, those members that I know around the table here, will know people don't just write in and support things. So we ask you to waive these conditions and I'll sit down. Thank you. We're also available for questions if you want them. Does anyone have any questions that they wish to ask? No, we're fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your deputation. Okay, we'll move on to item six, confirmation of the minutes. And we're considering the ordinary meeting of the 19th of September. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare them carried. Uh, we'll now move on to the announcements uh, by the presiding member. So I do have a few this evening, so I do ask members of the public gallery to, to bear with me tonight. Um, I'd just like to mention that we are heading into event season and we do have a number of events happening over the next couple of weeks. On Thursday morning we are celebrating Ride to Work Week with a community bike breakfast at 7am at the Oxford Street Reserve. Um, this weekend we have the Garage Sale Trail which is over two days this year. Um, we do um, get up to about 350,000 people across Australia participating in the Garage Sale Trail and understand that WA has the highest per capita rate of participation. And there's usually a good trail in Vincent. I did have a bit of a look on the website where you can actually search on your suburb. It's www.garagesale.com.au. And I did spot a pretty interesting one in Mount Hawthorne. It's called Will from the Bachelorette is getting married and his fiancé is making him get rid of all his stuff. So there's a variety of garage sales out there and to, to encourage you to embrace it and go with it and see what sort of wacky stuff is out there. And apparently it is legitimate. So I hope that wasn't a spoiler because I don't watch The Bachelorette. Um, the Mount Hawthorne Old School Community Fair is happening on Saturday the 28th of October. The City of Vincent is very proud to provide a, sponsor a sponsorship grant for the fair and we will be hosting a stall there so we hope to see you there. Um, then the next day on the 29th of October Sunday will be the Pride Fair Day. This is a return to Fair Day. They did have a bit of a hiatus, so we're really glad to see them back and we're especially happy that they've chosen to have Fair Day at Birdwood um, Square in our neighbourhood this year. So we're really looking forward to that one and we'll also be there on the stall. North Perth Local is um, getting on board the Spooky Spirit with an Angove Street Halloween party on Halloween, 4.30pm to 8pm, so it's very family friendly, um, supporting local business and again with a grant from City of Vincent, so encourage everyone to get down and enjoy that. And also I just wanted to highlight that the City of Vincent has just released its new spring edition of the Well and Wise program which is a whole host of social events for over 65s in Vincent. Um, also this Saturday is local government election day and um, I would just strongly encourage all residents and ratepayers to vote. At this stage it's probably a little bit late to rely on Australia Post but it's not too late to bring ballot papers into the City of Vincent or to claim new ones if it's been lost to the recycling bin or didn't make it in the first place. Um, it's just interesting to note that as of today we've had a 25% return rate in the North Ward and a 22.75% return rate in the South Ward. So um, this is relatively typical of lo local government. It's not great. I think we can do better. Local government is important, so I'd really encourage everyone to participate. Um, so that brings me to a special presentation this evening. Um, Given that it is council elections, we do have one of our long-standing council members stepping down, and that is Councillor Matt Buckles. I'd also like to welcome tonight Jess and Jack and Charlie to the meeting. Um, Matt's family, it's great to see you here. So Matt, 
I have prepared a few words for you. I hope you're prepared to suffer through this. There's some great quotes out there on the internet. <laughs> David Bell is a wonderful source, that's all I can say. So, look, just to, just to start off, back in 2009 you were elected to the City of Vincent after two attempts. Um, you came onto the scene offering to rock the boat and to ruffle a few established feathers, and I think that you can say that you safely did that. You also like to be photographed in a rowing boat. Um, often on European lakes, which was a bit of a point of contention. <laughs> but you were driven by a desire to see genuine change, um, an increase in our plastics recycling, that's a tick, restoring the Hyde Park lakes, that's another tick, um, bringing a focus to our town centres, tick, um, making Vincent carbon neutral, you can't win them all. You've got to <laughs> Still a way to go there. Um, but look, you were a passionate voice on the Vincent to Perth campaign. You had a fierce anti-position on the crazy idea of splitting Vincent. To one of your quotes was, Earth to City of Perth, get with the program. Real cities need real people. Um, you were part of the working group on this issue, um, which saw some of the biggest rallies that the City of Vincent has ever seen, with great turnouts on Angove Street. And you famously even started a Vincent to Perth memes Facebook page, which reached the dizzying heights of 68 likes. <laughs> You've never been shy to speak your mind, another quote that I particularly love. Whichever genius decided Beaufort Street would benefit from having not one, not two, but three local governments in charge, well, they deserve an Idiot of the Year medal and to be put on a paperclip sorting duty for a month if that's not beyond them. Those classic buckles there. <laughs> um, you first mooted the design excellence concept at a council meeting, something which is now being championed through the state government's design WA draft planning policy, and you have a strong interest in planning. You've been our DAP member representing the City of Vincent. You're always up for seconding planning items at council meetings, um, and you've been an advocate for density in bringing European heights and streetscapes to our main activity roads with a great passion for Oxford Street. Um, you do have a good appreciation of a quality design, a progressive approach, and um, I, another quote from The Voice which really perfectly sums it up, a libertarian leaning which sets him apart from other councillors more susceptible to nimbious complaints. <laughs> I don't personally agree with that. That's David Bell's interpretation. Um, you've regularly been referred to as a transport wizard, given your background in sustainable transport, and you're now pursuing further qualifications and a bona fide career as a planner, and we wish you all the very best in those pursuits. You've also pushed strongly for the community garden and been a real advocate for the men's shed. Also a big fan of bike lanes, and you've chaired our cycling pedestrian advisory group, and you've also been um, involved with young people through the children and young people advisory group. I have come to know you as Mr Leadable. You have lived in Leadable for 16 years with your wife Jess, Jack and Charlie, some dogs and, and some chooks, a dog and some chooks, not many dogs. But um, I love the way that you like to flout our uh, local law on chooks in the South Ward. Um, you have had a long time involvement. Jimmy Murphy pointed out to me that you were involved in the Arty Fadi Street Party about 10 years ago, which was the precursor to the Leadable Festival. And um, we do... We are still dealing with the shock that you're actually leaving not only council but lead of all. Um, we think we're probably more sh shocked than you are about that one. So I'd just like to say some of the other comments about you that you've been described as zany and idiosyncratic with a cheeky turn of phrase and an independent streak. Roz um, recalled that um, she liked it when you debated so well that you would talk yourself out of voting your intended way. <laughs> but also noted that you're able to have a spirited debate and a disagreement of ideas but still have friendly banter and a laugh um, at, um, afterwards. So that's, that's been really appreciated. Dan also thought it was pretty funny when you complained about being moved from your old council seat so that your expanding board patch was directly presented to the journalist desks and now maybe live streamed. You did make us laugh and honestly wonder when you, um, when you used a pretty strange analogy about... Um, pandas when you were trying to demonstrate your commitment to plastic banning the plastic bag and sustainability generally and you then went on to make a link between plastic free july and the refugee challenge we're still we're still 
puzzled by that, but we, we like to recall it because it does make us laugh. So we know that if we miss this banter in, in council meetings, all we have to do is uh, visit the West Australian Facebook page or any other numerous pages where we'll find you debating and taking on the whole of the metropolitan area. So we just want to conclude that you are one of our two longest serving council members and we will miss the moving and seconding double act that has been the, to the Toppleberg and Buckle show. Um, Matt, we'd like to congratulate you on your claim of dragging the City of Vincent out of the Dark Ages. Thank you for the confidence that you've placed in the rest of us who will remain to get on with this job and thank you for the part that you've played in this. To end with another Matt quote, the City of Vincent is almost unrecognisable compared to the Council I joined in 2009 and it is because we've made brave decisions. We've overhauled what we do and how we do it and we've built an administration that really gets Vincent. So Matt, congratulations and thank you so much for the eight years of community service. Now comes the part where under our council allowances policy we are allowed to award you with a framed certificate um, and I'd also just like to say that council members and the CEO have personally contributed towards a gift, not City of Vincent funded, personal contributions just to be crystal clear on that because we no longer give gifts to council members paid for by the City of Vincent so if you'd like to come forward so that I can present you with your certificate. actually something a little bit more serious in the bag, it's not just the panda onesie, but yes. Something to wear um, at Halloween on Ango Street, Matt. <laughs> um, Matt, I don't know if you wish to respond. You're welcome to. You may be overwhelmed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I'll just speak very, very briefly, just to say that it's been an absolute pleasure to be on the City of Vincent Council. Um, it was something I had desired to do for a good few election cycles before I was eventually um, successful. I'd just like to put a shout out to former Councillor Dudley Meyer in the audience, who um, certainly assisted me very greatly in those early days and um, before being on council, sort of scheming to instill a bit of regime change around the place and I, and I leave, um, I think the decision when I decided that I was going to leave was when I realised that we'd sort of done the job in, you know, I felt that I really had to be here to make things happen and I do feel that things will happen without me, which, which is just fine and, and now I've decided to move to Wembley Downs as well so it kind of makes it a bit more, more final. But look, just thank you to everyone who's around me now. Um, thank you to Jess and Jack and Charlie for putting up with me um, often not quite being at home as often as I might be. And also, you know, um, I've been serving with um, former mayors Nick Catania, McTean and John Carey and a whole swathe of councillors. Actually, all were really good people to work with even though you know, especially in the early days, we definitely didn't see eye to eye, but actually I learned an awful lot from, from all of those councillors, and it's a, it's a real honour to be a councillor, and it's a real... Um, I'm going to tear up now. <laughs> I think you guys, you just do a great job, and good luck to the people running on the weekend, and thank you very much for the, for the good eight years. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and also thank you to Jess and the boys for sharing him with us for all of these many hours that, were, that he has worked over the last eight years. Um, we'll now move on to declarations of interest. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. We've just received one at this stage from myself in relation to item 18.1, Chief Executive Officer's performance review. The nature of my interest is a financial interest, the purpose being that the report relates to my performance in the role of Chief Executive Officer, my remuneration and my contract of employment with the City. 
Thank you, CEO. I'll now um, go around to councillors to see if there's any reports that they wish to bring forward for debate this evening, in addition to those that have already been raised by the public gallery or that are requiring an absolute majority decision. Councillor Hallett, you're indicating no. Councillor Buckles, is there any particular items? Councillor Loden? 11.2, uh, 11.3 and 11.8. Councillor Buckle, uh, sorry, Councillor Toppleberg. Uh, Ten point one, thank you. Councillor Murphy. No further items, thanks. Councillor Harley. Eleven, eleven point three. Thank you. Just to highlight, we'll also um, raise 9.3 because it has been raised through a deputation as opposed to through the um, public question time. Okay, thank you. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, council members and members of the gallery, I'll just now read through the agenda items which council is going to consider adopting on block, that is as per the officer recommendation, a number of items together. Excluded from these items will be the items that related to a public question or the deputation or require an absolute majority decision or which the council members have now just indicated a desire to discuss separately. So the following items council will now consider adopting on block as per the officer recommendation printed in the agenda. They are item 11.1, .1, the review of the risk management policy. Item 11.5, financial statements. 11.6, authorisation of expenditure. 11.7, investment report. 13.1, information bulletin. And 13.2, approval of council briefing and meeting dates for 2018. Do I have a mover and a seconder for the on block items? Moved, Councillor Harley. Seconded, Councillor Murphy. Thank you. All those in favour? Just wanted to keep me waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, just for people's information, the way that we deal with council items is that we first go to the items that were raised during public question time. So we do jump around the council agenda a little bit, just to explain why. So the first item that was raised tonight was item 9.4, which is numbers 1, um, 16 to 17. Harwood Place, West Perth, change of use from multiple dwellings to service apartments, amendment to approval. Do I have a mover for this item? Moved Matt, uh, Councillor Buckle, seconded Councillor Loden. Excuse me, will I just um, arrange potential amendments and replacement? The replacement reports for the other one, isn't it? Yes. Um, look, this is a it's a it's a it's a difficult report in that this was a, a set of departments that offers, operated without approval for quite a long time, and then has had conditions put upon it. And I'm not led to believe that the the impact that the um, that the apartments have on the local neighbours has lessened over the time that it has been approved. Um, however, we're being asked to make some changes to obviously, which are essentially to, well, in some way to assist it to operate in a more appropriate manner, but also really just to reduce the obligations on the apartments to, um, to provide some level of staffing which may assist assist with these um the issues that are that are arising um i am i'm not particularly swayed by arguments that the 
the officer recommendation uh, contains on reasonable um, on, on reasonable conditions. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with what are they. In fact, if anything, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that they're they're not strict enough. Um, I, I, I just think that it's um, ultimately when when apartments are built for the purpose of being residential apartments and approved for being residential apartments. If, um, if the argument is that having appropriate levels of staffing or, ma or management make it a, not a going concern as a service department, well then those service departments can always become the apartments that they were originally approved to be for people, for residential people to live in. So I don't um, really know that it's my place to, to try and ensure that something can continue in a use that really wasn't intended in the first place. Um, I do note that there are Two, uh, two amendments in, in front of us. Um, in, in front of us, uh, um, but I will. I'm, I will actually leave it to other councillors to see if they would like to, to move those. Um, I'm, and I'm interested in the debate as to whether or not I'd be uh, interested in changing the actual, the actual officer recommendation as it stands. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, I thought maybe an opportunity to ask administration or maybe the mayor on um, the distinction between the two amendments and what was intended behind them would be useful. I'm happy to answer that question as the person who's um, requested them. Um, there are two amendments here for consideration. The first on the blue requires requires a um, security personnel per, um, presence on site at all times between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights and on Sundays where it's, where it's followed by a public holiday. So that would be a 12-hour on-site presence for two nights of the week, three nights if there is a public holiday Monday. The amendment on the green is a, less, a lesser um, in terms of the actual presence on site, it's reduced. It actually would require a security personnel to um, attend and conduct walkthroughs. So they would not have to be present at all hours, but could patrol and attend um, the, the service departments during the same um, time span of 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. But instead of being there uh, present at all times, it would be six, um, six visits during the 12-hour period. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm happy to move the uh, amendment on the green uh, for discussion. Um, I guess, oh, yeah. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Murphy. Um, similar to Councillor Buckles, I have concerns. I mean, there was a lot of issues raised in the community. Obviously, a lot of people have come out to the meeting tonight and also to the briefing. Um, some of those issues are things that are not part of the planning process around uh, that they're really police matter, but there is uh, an issue around security in this space, clearly. Um, so I'm supportive of the amendment on the green there. Thank you. Yes, I'm supportive of the amendment. I just wanted to get some clarification. So if we did um, put this forward, would this um, be reviewed within 12 months? Is that Right, could I just get that? That is a very good question and a question that I discussed with the Acting Director of Development Services and I will actually hand over to the Acting Director to um, respond to that question. Thank you, through the Chair. So um, the way that the condition is worded on the green, um, the requirements would need to be included in the management plan. Um, as part of the yearly review, the city would have the opportunity to um, review how many complaints have been received as a result of the development. Um, should any change to that element of the condition be required, it would require a further um, amendment to the condition, much the same way that this current development application is proposing to amend the condition. So just to clarify, when I 
discussed putting forward amen an amendment. I thought that this is something that could be tweaked through the um, management plan if there was an improvement, but in seeking advice from the development services, my understanding is that this would form a condition of approval so that if there was a review and um, these issues were no longer such of such concern, um, it would still it would require a development application for an amendment to an existing approval, just to be crystal clear. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to speak to the item or ask any further questions? Uh, no, I'm okay, thanks. Thank you. Madam Mayor, just a question. Um, ha and I saw, we saw a late email today, but prior to today, has had this been discussed at all with the applicant or the owner? Um, it has been, but the applicant has also put forward a request for deferral. Um, to have a further discussion with the city and um, the owners. I think that's the owners are seeking involvement at this stage. I'm not sure that that extends to discussion with the residents. It, it does, yes. That is a positive development, but that's only just developed in the six, six o'clock, past I'm six o'clock. I'm happy to deal with that when yeah, we're back to the substantive, does, but just in relation to the amendment. Yes. Because the financial impost is significant. I just want to know if it's been discussed at all, and other than the feedback that elected members received uh, at about 5.30 this afternoon, has there been any discussion uh, with the applicant in relation to the potential impact? So just um, from my perspective, I did ask for the amendments to be provided to Urbanista, and that has happened. And then I'll just ask the direct acting director if um, any further discussion happened after they were provided. Thank you. Through the Chair, um, the amendments were provided to Urbanista this afternoon and I also spoke with them on the phone um, to discuss the implications of both options. Can I just confirm that the response was that whilst they did seek quotes that it's something that they weren't able to uh, they weren't able to comment on that that that's further uh, I suppose further um, uh, that that further fueled their desire to have the matter deferred so that they would be able to respond appropriately to what the impact of this proposed amendment would be. Is that correct? Acting Director, would you like to take that question or would you prefer that I take the question? No, okay. Sorry, would you be able to clarify the question? I'm just, just So the request to defer came in prior to this proposed amendment, but my understanding from the response that elected members received, I'm just wanting to confirm that uh, the applicant, who is ultimately a consultant, uh, has, uh, has said that given the nature of this amendment and the potential impact, that that added further reason to them wishing to defer the matter so they could discuss it with their client. Is that, am I correct? That's where we stand? Through the chair, yes. There was a request for deferral before the amendments were prepared, but without clarification as to um, what, um, what that why, the reason why, and we did seek additional information. And the development um, just prior to the meeting or at the meeting tonight is that the applicant is saying that they would like to hold a meeting between the City of Vincent, the owners, Urbanista and the residents. So that's, that's, um, that's new. Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to state anything further? No, I'm happy for the amendment to go to the vote, but I'll speak on the substantive. Councillors, there is um, anyone wish to state anything further? Does anyone wish to move a deferral? Um, or do I put this to the vote? In the amendment, okay. All right, I'm gonna put the amendment to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Toppelberg. Okay, so a few things. Um, so um, I'll, when I finish, I will actually move the deferral just to test it because I'll speak to that in a second. I just want to note something that's in the existing management plan. Um, so on page uh, 96 of the agenda under the management plan, uh, I understand uh, 
two elements that relate one relates to the operation of the facility. It says 24 hour contact details of the service department, owners, licensed operator and the relevant security company to be provided to all owners, occupiers of the adjoining residential properties on Harwood Place. Um, I'm not going to ask the question. It's been indicated to us from some of the long term residents or owners that that's not been the case. Uh, and so that is something that needs to be addressed because that was clearly a condition uh, that uh, was quite passionately um, placed on, on the uh, approval when it came to Council last time. Um, in relation to the contentions about uh, the um, three night minimum stay, I'll also note that in the uh, applicant's own management plan it says the three night minimum stay prevents people from leasing the apartments for weekend periods only, whereby it is more likely that noise and other disturbances may occur. So I'm not really understanding why it is that they're now telling us that it's not that that's not, not going to be an issue or the case where in their own management plan it actually identifies that that is the risk of having a shorter minimum stay. So I do have issue with that. But in terms of procedural fairness in my time here, I've never had an applicant request a deferral and at least not be put to the test. So um, I will allow others to speak, but I'm happy to remove a, uh, to move uh, a deferral and see how that goes, because I do think that in terms of procedural fairness and given some of the issues uh, that are on the table, it's probably in everybody's interest uh, for that to occur. But I'll happily allow others to speak because this matter has been um, before Council and unfortunately in front of the community um, for a long, lengthy period of time. I will also note that uh, um, uh, uh, Ms Sandry, who spoke um, from the applicant, initially spoke about the angst of being the applicant and having to deal with this for 12 months. Well, I can hardly imagine what it must be like for the neighbours who've had to put up with this for years without any approval uh, in place and then since the approval's been in place with the number of the key planning conditions that were supposed to ameliorate the impact on the neighbours not having been adhered to. So I do think if we're talking procedural fairness it's probably a lot uh, less happy for the poor people who are living across the road from it than it is from the people who own and run the facility. But I will allow others to speak if they wish to before moving the deferral. Um, Councillor Hallett, unless you wish to speak, I'm, I'll go ahead, but I just want to check with you. Yep, okay. Um, look, I agree, Councillor Toppelberg. Um, when I was first approached about deferral, I sought specific grounds on which it would be um, deferred, given that this has been going on for a long time. Um, I do think that um, the applicant has probably been a little slow to acknowledge some of the issues of concern. I'm really pleased to hear that they're now prepared to sit down with the residents and have a discussion. But I do think that there needs to be some acknowledgement that this has been um, something that has caused impacts on the amenity of the residents for some time, um, that there have been conditions that, that haven't been met and that the uh, accommodation is not being advertised in, in um, accordance with the existing condition of a three night minimum stay and the 24 hour reception which whilst does seem a um, particularly um, harsh condition and there's never been any attempt to meet that in any way whatsoever. It does sound from the um, information that Council has been provided that there is a lack of management of the site and I think that that really gets to the crux of the issue about this request to amend the existing approval to remove the 24 hour reception. That's where I have some concern and hesitancy and I have been mindful of the fact that that requirement is um, would be very difficult economically for a 16 unit um, service department but there has to be some way to go towards a to demonstrate that this is going to be managed in a way that does not continue to impact on residential amenity. Um, I do note that the pick-up drop-off area has been satisfied and I do note that while it might not appear to be a traditional reception desk, there is actually a table and chairs where people can be um, received and where there can be information provided about um, the management plan and um, information about the, the um, accommodation. Um, there has also been a complaint that there hasn't been a contact number provided for residents, so in order of actually lodging complaints they have found that difficult. Um, I do feel that it has gone on for so some time. I have also had residents contact me asking me when this will come to Council and be finalised. They have been quite concerned about it and wanting it to be dealt with and they are particularly concerned about the week, weekend activity which is where the amendment has really focused. But I do think that now that the applicant has actually offered to sit down, not just, not just the um, representatives but the owners, to sit down with, the, um, with their representatives, the city and residents, I think that is a proactive approach. It is 
coming late in the day, but given that that's been offered, I do support that approach and I do think there is merit in actually sitting down and having a discussion and working out a way to improve the management, particularly on those weekend nights, in a way that can meet the concerns of the residents and also address the concerns of cost in terms of having personnel in attendance um, at either all times or regular intervals. So um, as Mayor, I'm not able to um, move a deferral and um, I would have to leave that up to my council members. So I'm happy to move the deferral. Can we be time specific as well and defer it? Well, I would like to see this at, back to, at the next month's meeting. I was going to say meeting. deferred so for a period, yeah. uh, so no, later, the no later than the November council, council meeting. meeting. Yes. Um, seconded Councillor Murphy. Oh, just proceed, just, that means that regardless of what happens in between offices, because that's the council decision, it, it will come back to that meeting. So if nothing has occurred, the decision will still come back to that council meeting. Is that correct? If we defer it to the November meeting? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'd be surprised if nothing comes back. Um, at the very least, the administration's report will come back to Council. That's um, right. That's but right. there is no reason for some um, progress and discussion to not result in, a, in um, further information being included in the report to Council that comes to November meeting. So I have a mover and a seconder. All those in favour of deferral? All those against? Oh, it was carried unanimously. Thank you. So we will follow up on that offer and um, take it up and organise a meeting through the City of Vincent. So thanks, we'll be in touch. And thank you to the residents for attending. Okay, we'll now move on to the item raised during the deputation, which is um, 400 and, oh, where are we? Uh, 452 to 460 William Street, Perth, change of use from shop to tavern. Do I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just uh, quickly, I guess to clarify my understanding of where we've got to, I think uh, the applicant is happy with the results. There's just a clarification around um, the whether or not it is eligible for for a 0.85 reduction in factor being applied to both the shop and the tavern for car parking um, because it is within 800 metres of a train. And I just wanted to get uh, we received that via email, but I haven't seen a response from administration as to whether that would be eligible or not. So through the chair, um, the parking calculation that is um, provided as replacement attachment six um, to the council report tonight um, shows that the um, adjustment factor being within 400 metres of a bus route has been applied to um, both the shop use and the tavern use. Um, so that adjustment factor has already been applied to the application um, and clearly falls beyond the 800 metre um, distance that's required under note to uh, point one of table two in the parking policy. So just to clarify, um, so be are you saying that because it's within 400 metres of a bus route, you can't be, you can't get a reduction for being within 400 metres of a bus route, but then also get a reduction for being within 400, 800 metres of a train, or is it that because it is 959 metres walking or 869 metres as the crow flies, that it's outside the 800 metre zone, so therefore it's not eligible? Through the chair, um, the second of what you just said there. And is that assessed based on walking or is that assessed as the crow flies? Um, in the, through the chair, in the policy, it requires um, the distance to be measured from the pedestrian entrance to the development along footpaths. Okay. 
I move to the second to Councillor Hallett. Uh, thanks. Um, look, I'm broadly supportive of um, the officer re recommendation. I think it is a, a it's a location that requires um, more activation and, and filling some of those spaces. Um, I guess I am concerned in the current climate around some of the barriers that we put in place for new businesses. Um, but I understand that the cash and loo has been reduced um, through some of these recalculations, which is a good thing. Um, I guess, are you able to clarify just the payment over five years and what that would um, entail and whether there's any other kind of parameters for um, making the payments easier for applicants? Through the chair, um, it's up to the applicant and the city to come to an agreement as to um, what payments required at what point in time and agree that in writing. Thank you. So we're just looking at the timetable for the blue cat to see whether it actually does travel during the times of operation of the of the of the tavern, the proposed tavern. And just to report back that um, it appears to on Friday and Saturday nights it does have a full service through to uh, 1 a.m. and 12:33 um, a.m. and um, a much reduced service on Sundays and public holidays. Um, and at Monday to Thursday, it does um, conclude its services at 7.15 p.m. Just for interest. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So a few comments. Uh, very pleased to see the uh, officer's change of heart since the briefing about the opening hours. I think that's fair. I think that that's suitable for what's been proposed. Um, Look, the, I'll just make some general comments about the use uh, and what we're really debating. Otherwise, I think we we're all pretty much in agreement with the applicant, and that's the, uh, about cash in lieu or car parking. Um, I think it's a good adaptive uh, reuse of a heritage, uh, heritage listed building. Uh, I think that uh, the focus on bringing people into the street is great and is something that um, that part of William Street will benefit from greatly. In terms of principle, and whilst uh, there's no question that I don't think anyone views this as a tavern in the sense of being a, a beer barn or otherwise. Uh, this is exactly the reason why the discussion about the exclusions of tavern and small bar uh, was put into the car parking policy, and that is that ultimately, uh, whilst we're talking about, uh, and forgive me if I get the terminology wrong, but we're talking about uh, low intervention uh, uh, wines, or we're talking about specific product, ultimately the, product is the specific product being sold on site isn't contained in, in terms of the planning approval uh, and you know, there's, there's no difference to any other uh, wine store and uh, an eating house that would be able to have uh, takeaway sales and to have um, people um, drinking uh, without the purchase of food, which is ultimately what the licence covers. But beyond that, the principle was losing fine grain retail in small spaces to uh, food and beverage and specifically alcohol-based uses. Uh, it's something that we'd seen extensively on Beaufort Street and has changed the daytime economy there significantly. And because of, in principle, regardless of what the actual content of the alcoholic beverages is, in principle there are greater margins able to be uh, achieved through the sale of, al of alcohol uh, for consumption on site usually than there are with traditional retail products. And that was something we'd noticed, and so it was put in there as a uh, as a planning method to try and ensure that we weren't seeing uh, owners seeking effectively alcohol-based rents or profits in businesses that enabled them uh, the, the changes that we saw, where we lost uh, within the city a lot of traditional or a lot of small-scale retail to food and beverage uses, and particularly with the focus on alcohol sales. So, I think whilst I fully support uh, the, the application and the intent, and I think it's a great use for the space. All of that was known at the time of the application, uh, and I don't think there's anything that's been mysterious about it. Um, I'm happy that we got to the, where we got to in terms of the cash in lieu. It's absolutely an onerous dollar figure if you look at it up front and, you know, on a square metre rate or any other way, but if you look at some of the arguments that have been put forth, for instance, the prevalence of paid parking in the area, that's the best sign that we have that car parking pressure is extreme in the area, and that's why we've had to introduce paid parking uh, to be able to manage it. So um, whilst it's unfortunate that the space doesn't provide, isn't able to provide any car parking, uh, those factors are 
those things are taken into account um, in the cumulative, uh, cumulative assessment in terms of the car parking table. And uh, again, if you look at it uh, in the most crude terms, uh, which is by the hour over, say, the five-year period, it, it is relatively inexpensive as far as uh, the car parking, uh, the car parking uh, spaces that we're seeking. So I think we're down, if you're looking per bay per hour, you're looking at something uh, in the order of about 22 cents uh, uh, per bay per hour over, over the five-year period. And ultimately, once that amount is paid off, if the business is uh, still operational, those bays are effectively free. So in principle, that, that burden is being uh, taken on by the community and by the city. Um, I will also note that, uh, and happily stand corrected, uh, but Director of Corporate Services, if you could just confirm uh, the cash in lieu funds need to be spent within a specified period of time while the applicant is able to seek return of those funds. That provision has been removed. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I, I support the use. I think that the calculation of the cash in lieu is correct and I think that we uh, have been have consistently applied it and certainly in this circumstance it's probably, whilst the applicant would disagree, is a good example of uh, uh, why it was put in place for, uh, for um, and why the, uh, the ability or the, the, the desire to exempt uh, certain uses was uh, specified in the policy and Tavern and Small Bar were excluded from them. Um, thank you. Sorry, these questions may um, have been asked already when I was out of the room, but I've got a couple. I do um, support in principle the opening of a small bar on that um, area, although I do share um, concerns echoed by Councillor Topperberg about an alcohol-based um, economy. Um, my concerns relate to the fact that there are residential properties in quite close proximity. So there's a couple of things here in regards to the acoustic report. I want to find out from the officers why we're not requiring an acoustic report in advance or as part of this approval process rather than um, post the approval as we've done on so many other applications. That's my first question. Uh, through the chair, I Condition five of the resolution requires an acoustic report um, to be provided and approved by the city prior to the commencement of the development. Okay, so my comment in regards to that is we've had a number of applications before this council where we have poured over the details of acoustic reports and one comes to mind which is the corner of Scrubber Beach Road and uh, uh, Flinders, I think, which is um, all the... the the street the shopping centre is on, so the very corner that was a bar, albeit it had residential upstairs, but it's primarily in a, um, a town centre, so the type of place where you would encourage a small bar. I have grave concerns in agreeing to this this evening without understanding the noise impact, and I, I feel like there needs to be some consistency in what we see coming before us. If this was just a commercial zone, I wouldn't be bothered about it. but. You have an R80 um, block nearby. You have residents diagonally um, on both areas. And I do think there's going to be an impact with 28 people um, in Alfresco. I am very supportive of activating these spaces. And I love um, seeing Alfresco being used. And I think, it would be, I think it would be a really lovely place to be. But I am very concerned about um, the residents. I note there were six objections. Um, I feel I've got an absence of information to know whether I'm making a good decision or not tonight. I do share some, con some concerns over 28 people being at the front of that um, property. And at this point, um, I'm not going to be able to support this without an acoustic report. Um, I'd be happy to move a deferral if, if people are leaning towards not supporting it. I'm happy to see this come back with some more fulsome um, information as we have required of other applicants before us. Councillors, Councillor Buckles. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Look, I'm, I'm happy to support the, the application. I think it's a good use, good use for the space. Um, I note that it's immediately adjacent or, or opposite to a number of other eating or dining um, meat candies just down the road on the other side of Brisbane Street. So I don't think, I actually don't think it would be very likely that 
noise will be an issue at all at, the, at this site, just in regard to Councillor Harley's comments just then. Um, look, if we were to give extra discounts for cash in lieu due to proximity to the Blue Cat bus route, then that would be, oh, I'm, I, I'm looking at meat candy over the road, I assume that they would have got a bigger discount and lots of other places would have got a bigger discount if we had our rule that you had to be near a bus that went near the train station and we were in 800 metres of that bus stop. And to be honest, as a transport wizard, as was quoted by the Mayor earlier, I don't believe that people will get off the train and incur a transfer penalty to the Blue Cat and then catch the Blue Cat 300 metres and then walk up William Street. They will, they will just walk up William Street and they'll walk up William Street quite happily because it's not, it's not that far. But it is outside the 800 metres and certainly um, I think if Council was going to apply some discretion of the 800 metres, I think we'd be better off just saying I think we need to be show some discretion in terms of the parking required, I'm not saying that I necessarily support that, rather than try and bring in the fact that the Blue Cat may go in some way of, um, of um, delivering, delivering an extra transport benefit, because I just think that's a, that sort of locks us, <laughs> locks us into an interpretation of our policy, which, which isn't an accurate interpretation of the policy. I think that I am... Um, you know, the twenty thousand dollars spread out over five years, four thousand dollars a year. It's um, oh, you know, maybe I'm naive. I'm not a small business or small bar owner, but if that if that's going to make or break your financial capability to run to run a a small bar, then um, then then I guess um. I, th I think that's a pretty tight margin to be to be concerned concerned about, and our policy is out in the open, and people know what the policy. What the policy is, I think it's been interpreted fairly liberally to get down to the the 3.72 car bays that there are there now. Um, and so I'm quite happy supporting the, the officer recommendation. I think um, I did have a, a conversation with the with the applicant um, or an applicant representative uh, during the during the course, and I did indicate that it's it's not it's not totally unheard of us unheard of for us to have a different approach to cash in lieu or to consider special circumstances but I just think at the top end of this of this particular street with a whole heap of other businesses in the area for, you know we've got as I mentioned the Vietnamese kebabs the um, cafes meat candy you know I think I think um, I think that the approach we're taking here is entirely consistent with what we would have taken for all of those other businesses around it's not like it's in a totally um, remote area that um, it, it, this sort of activation is unheard of. This just seems to be a total normal kind of use for the kind of building in question in the location that it's in, and it should be should be um, subject to our regular cash in lieu policies. Thank you. Excuse me, Chair. I have a question. Sorry, sure. um, sorry, I forgot um, to ask these. Um, in regards to the tavern licence, are you able to explain why a tavern licence was necessary for this venue? And to outline what the characteristics are of a tavern licence. So, um, what, what ultimately does a tavern licence provide you? Sorry, um, through the chair, a tavern licence is obtained through um, the former Department of Gaming, Racing and Liquor. Um, in terms of the difference between um, a tavern licence and other licences that are issued by the department, a tavern licence effectively allows the operator to um, sell packaged liquor um, in addition to allowing for on-site consumption. Um, that differs to other licence types which are restricted um, either with special approval circumstances such as liquor stores where they would um, in those instances only be allowed to sell uh, for the sale of packaged liquor as opposed to on-site consumption um, and with restaurants uh, and eating houses, they would only be allowed to have on-site consumption and no license, uh, no package um, liquor sales. And what are the other characteristics of a tavern licence? I'm pretty sure from my memory of the MES um, application some years ago, there were a number of other characteristics that a tavern licence would provide. Um, through the Chair, in terms of the overall um, licence category listings that the department issues, um, that's the fundamental difference between um, the two licence types um, that we've been provided and understand to be the case. Councillor Harley, I do recall what you're referring to. In that particular circumstance, it was about the number of people that they wanted to have at the establishment and a small bar licence is capped at 80 
persons, including staff, I believe. So in this case, the licence is about the ability to sell packaged alcohol. And so my question about the licence is, so once the liquor licence is issued, um, I'm just wanting to understand the breadth of the liquor licence versus the breadth of the um, DA that's in front of us. So I guess my question is, if this goes ahead tonight, at some future point, if the numbers were to increase, for example, um, does that need to come back here? Um, are there any other characteristics? Um, so I recall from the mayors, I'm not saying this is an issue, but I know that they can operate a TAB, I think as well was the issue up at the mayors, that was the biggest concern. So my question is, is there no other licence that was more suitable for this DA, given that they only require um, 50 people and they they're not looking at setting up a, a full-on... Um, the number of people or the customers are a condition of planning approval, so that if there was to be a request to extend that, it would have to come back as an amendment to the approval. And my understanding is that it's purely on the basis of selling packaged alcohol because that is not permitted under a small bar licence. Do you wish to add anything further? Um, just through the Chair, in terms of the definition under the scheme, um, the use as been proposed by the applicant um, involves uh, the consumption, primarily the consumption of um, alcohol on site, and the secondary, the secondary component is the um, licence arrangement. So for the purposes of this application, um, it needs to satisfy both of those elements. Thank you. My final question in regards to this particular liquor licence is... Um, so that if the DA goes ahead, could the applicant under this licence, bearing in mind that businesses can be sold, could they at some point turn this into just packaged alcohol for takeaway purposes? Um, through the Chair, the definition under the scheme talks about um, primarily for consumption of alcohol and um, it talks about the liquor licence through the Department of Gaming, Racing and Liquor. Um, so there would always need to be an element of on-site consumption. Um, if, they, if there was to be a future application where they just wanted to sell packaged liquor, that would require a different licence and a, and a different um, application to be lodged for a totally different use. Councillor Harley, we've spoken. Uh, any other councillor Buckles wish to ask a question? Well, yeah, just um, just to clarify something on the parking calculation. I know we're talking, we're just talking about small bar license or various license that would be applicable. Could I just ask, would the parking requirement through you, Chair, to the relevant staff member, if the parking calculation would be different if it was a small bar application versus a the the tavern license that is currently being applied for? I believe I asked a similar question at the briefing and the answer was that the car parking calculation is based on the number of customers, but I'll just seek clarification that that absolutely is the case and that wouldn't be impacted by a different use. Through the chair, um, the, the parking requirement would be the same um, for a tavern and a small bar. Because it's been calculated on the basis of number of customers, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, look, I support this um, proposal. Uh, I don't share the same concern as Councillor Harley in regards to noise. I think that. 28 people sipping wine and eating cheese on the street, it's probably not going to um, cause too many dramas, though I do understand where you're coming from with the previous. Um, but in this case, I don't think that's an issue. Um, I understand um, and acknowledge Councillor Toppelberg's um, concern around um, reducing the cash in lieu, uh, and which we impose on um, to, well, not so much protect retail, but acknowledge that... Um, that uh, alcohol and well, food and beverage does generally um, uh, is a little more lucrative, but I do understand 
that this is only a 50-person um, store and um, hospitality outlet, which is very small. Um, but in saying that, um, it is $20,000 spread over uh, five years, which is about $76 a week. Um, and I think that uh, I would encourage you to have a... a um, retain a close relationship with the city. There's a number of things that we can do to help support your business um, through marketing, through events, um, through the local town team on the ground there on William and I'm sure that there's um, ways in which that you might be surprised and recruit, recoup that um, expense. Um, so I uh, will be supporting uh, this as per the officer's recommendation. Councillors, I think if any councillor Loden wish to speak, oh no, I wish to speak. I was just checking if anyone else wanted to speak first. Um, look, I do support the application. I like the sound of this business. I understand why it is that you've sought a tavern um, license. Um, it sounds like an interesting mix of sales and um, small bar under a tavern license. In relation to noise and acoustics uh, reports, I'm quite comfortable with the condition in the report that requires. Um, requires a uh, acoustic report pl prior to commencement of the development so that satisfies um, my cons my concern in fact I raised the issue of the 10 p.m. finish um, on a on a Friday and Saturday night given that this is effectively a town centre um, in relation to the cash in lieu I do congratulate you on exploring every avenue and I think that you've done well to represent your applicant in that way but I do think that this is a, an issue that we need to apply fairly to all small businesses that are often in the same situation we do support independent small business in the city of Vincent and we welcome you and we wish you all the best with this application um, but we do need to be fair about the way that we apply our cash in lieu and that we have had many um, small independent businesses that would um, would be opening and, and, and operating in this manner and we, we do need to make sure that our policy is applied. I do apologise for the incorrect calculations that um, that we have had along this path. That's, that's been frustrating, I think, for everyone involved. So um, we have finally got there, and I think there's probably never been a car parking calculation that's been more scrutinised than this one. So we can safely assume now that every part of our policy has been fully applied to it, and all, all um, reductions under that policy have been applied, in, including for the heritage, um, the heritage value of the, of the property and um, and the uh, shortfall in the um, former in the current use. Uh, in relation to um, parking in this area, I also thought that I would add that during our Imagine Vincent consultation exercise, I did attend a consultation at the 399 bar, which is a three-minute walk away from from this um, proposed tavern. And I have to say that unlike any other event where people talked quite broadly about a range of issues and even despite prompting and asking if there was anything else that the um, traders wished to discuss, they were only interested in talking to me about parking. And I, I tell you that sincerely and genuinely that the traders at that um, part of William Street are really concerned about parking, talking to me about the prospect of building a multi-storey car park, concerned about their customers not being able to, to drop in and access. So parking in that area is a significant concern for existing traders and they made that well and truly clear at that particular event. So I thought that was also worth mentioning in the context of, of the cash and low conversation. I do support um, the officer recommendation and um, I look forward to seeing uh, the development of your of your small bar slash tavern slash wine sales establishment. Thank you. Is there any further comments or Councillor Loden wish to close debate? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Harley against? I declare it carried. Excuse me, Madam Mayor, can I just ask that we hear item 9.2 as the next item of business as the proponents in the gallery? Absolutely, we can do that. So we'll now move on to item 9.2 which is 404 Newcastle Street, West Perth. This is a change of use from warehouse to unlisted use motor vehicle repair shop and it is a retrospective application with an absolute majority decision required. Uh, moved Councillor Toppleberg, seconded Councillor Hallett. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so a few things. Uh, this isn't a declaration of interest, but it's just something to note. I'd, I'm certain that at some point well, on this lot, I can't tell you if it was here or across the road, but uh, I've had a, uh, an engine replaced in a vehicle sometime in the 1990s. So uh, absolutely, whilst this is retrospective, this use or a similar use has been uh, on the site, uh, certainly predating uh, this, this particular business uh, and absolutely predating the uh, source or the um, multi-residential multi uh, adjacent property, which has been the source of some of the noise complaints. Um, I won't talk much about the length of time and the nature of the application. I'll just make it fairly simple. So I've got two amendments that I would like to make. The first one uh, is on the pink, and that relates to the operating hours. So my understanding is the current... Well, I'll move it, which effectively it's uh, starting from 7 a.m. and finishing at 5.30 p.m. So Is there a second for Monday the amendment on the pink? Moved. Oh, sorry, seconded, Councillor Buckles. Thank you. Um, so essentially, whilst the current owner uh, works those, uh, those hours, I'd... It, it, something that jumped out to me as being unusual hours for that type of use and uh, in uh, discussion with the applicant my understanding was that that was the, the hours that they uh, run their business but when the question was asked about any potential succession planning or otherwise and what potentially uh, would be expected of a, uh, uh, what's of a motor vehicle repair shop, so effectively a mechanic, uh, I thought it was unusual uh, for any potentially the future sale or otherwise and when I noted that uh, to change those hours would require going through the same application process, which thus far has taken 500 and something days. The applicant indicated that they uh, they would like um, uh, to extend those hours and indicated that to me. I think in the notes provided by the staff, it was uh, highlighted that that didn't get to them in time to for them to review it and potentially amend uh, the application. But I, I have no issue with a motor vehicle repair shop operating, operating from uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. I think that's reasonable. I think most of them would actually probably start earlier than that, but I uh, think there's, there's, well, there's no issue in relation to the noise regs either, so um, yeah, I'll uh, say nothing further on it, but hopefully uh, to me it seems a reasonable uh, continuation of a use that has been existing for decades on the site. So I'll leave that one there for that amendment. Councillor Buckles. Uh, I'm happy to support the amendments in the bank, that's all. Councillors. I just had a question um, to the Acting Director of Development Services, just to clarify, is the current operation um, occurring from 7am? Through the Chair, uh, through you, no. The current operation, I understand, um, to be 8am until 4.30pm Monday to Thursday, 8am to 4pm Friday, and by appointment on Saturdays. Okay. Um, and just in relation to, no, actually I'm happy to support the amendment. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on this? No? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Back to the substantive. Yep. Is there any further debate? Sorry, on I'm still going. Are yeah. you still going? Yep, I did. So the other thing I wanted to address was, to me, condition 1.1, .1, which limits the occupation to one person uh, at any one time. Uh, I find that... And I do understand uh, whilst there's three working bays and obviously one person working, you know, three people can potentially drop three spanners at a time, which would potentially make it slightly noisier. But uh, I, I think, again, it's unduly onerous. And whilst that's the current occupancy, uh, it doesn't, for example, it wouldn't allow uh, the current owner or anyone to take on an apprentice, as an example. And I think that that alone warrants at least looking at two people. But I'd like to seek to amend 1.1 uh, to have a maximum of three, uh, three people operating from the premises at any one time. I think it's reasonable uh, in a mechanics workshop to have a number of people uh, working. If they do have three bays, I, I have no issue with allowing up to three people. So I will move to uh, delete one person and replace that with three people. Seconded, Councillor Harley. Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to speak? Councillor Harley, do you wish to speak to it? Is there any debate from council members? I'd just like to go to the acting director just to seek um, some perspective from the staff in terms of whether that would be seen to be um, an intensification of use that could be sustained um, appropriately here. If you've got any view you'd like to put forward on the amendment. Uh, yeah, thank you, if I may, through the chair. Um, 
The extent, oh, it, seem, it appears to be reasonable to allow um, an additional two people to operate at the premises um, and irrespective of the scale of the development, um, the use would need to operate in compliance with the noise regulations. Um, in addition, the submissions that were received during the consultation um, predominantly had issues with noise um, in the late evenings and weekends, which this um, amendment wouldn't... Um, change. So. Okay, and if there's any further questions or comments, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Okay, and just to finish, just a couple of comments. There's been some uh, correspondence from uh, the applicant and their um, associates in relation to the roller door. So whilst that's mentioned in the report, I will note the issue of potentially closing the roller door is something that's dealt with through the management plan and in just noting that in discussion with the acting director um, that there's not an expectation that the roller door be closed uh, at all times uh, during the operation of the business but it would be uh, something like contained in the management plan, uh, uh, something like when uh, activity that is going to require excessive noise such as grinding or something of that nature is to be carried out on site, the roller door would be closed to ameliorate some of the noise impact. So I think there was a a misunderstanding, but just wanted to mention in this forum that there's no, there isn't an expectation that the roller door would be shut uh, at all times because obviously that uh, provides for a pretty unpleasant work environment uh, and potentially the opening and closing of the doors would provide more of an issue with noise than actually uh, the operations proposed on site. Um, yeah, so for me, uh, yeah, I just think this is a good example of where government should get out of the way and let the business that should be able to operate on site and it has clearly is continuing what is uh, an existing use and also predates their ownership of it, just we should be getting out of the way and allowing it to continue reasonably and understanding that there have been some noise issues to, uh, from the site, but if you look at those complaints, the likelihood of them having come or been related to this particular business is uh, pretty much nil. Uh, it's more likely relating to businesses that are operating during other hours and yeah, hopefully they can continue on with uh, their livelihood and enjoyment of their property. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Harley? Um, I'm supportive um, of this. I do need to say that, and I raised it with the CEO, I'm pretty sure I got my car serviced this some time ago. I can't remember it, so I can't remember it. So on the basis of the advice I've received, I'm not declaring conflict of interest, but I just want to, on the public record, um, my questions actually relate to the fact that this has been a non-compliant business going back many, many years. Um, it would seem under the eyes of the City of Vincent. Um, so I've got some questions in regards uh, to the administration. Um, in regards to, um, we were obviously on site there back in 2009 where we investigated a noise complaint. Um, we were back there in 2014, I believe 2003 as well. There's been a number of dates raised through this report. Um, 2016, where, which is where I think it was picked up that this, there were non, potentially more than one non-compliant business um, on, um, on this site. So my question um, through the Mayor to the Administration or to the CEO is why wasn't this picked up earlier um, as a site that possibly didn't have approval? And um, I guess my other comment is generally in regards to retrospective approvals. Um, I will say that I believe it's totally incumbent upon a business to know what um, authorised environment that they are doing business in. And I have to say on the record, I don't believe there's any excuse for a business operating without the full approval of the local authority. Um, and I, my only wish is that retrospective fees could be knocked out of the ballpark in terms of what we charge people because I don't believe it's fair for businesses who are jumping through many, many, many hoops that we put them through, and we're trying to reduce that, but they do jump through a lot of hoops, even just to set up a business before they can even start renovating or open the doors when other businesses in the city operate for many, many years without approval. So my question, again, through the administration is how were we able to send officers on site numerous times and not know that there were non-compliant businesses potentially operating? Through the Chair, um, I understand that in 2009 and 2014 um, 
and 2016. The complaints that were raised were specific to um, noise issues. Um, the one in 2009, the noise issue was resolved promptly by the applicant and resulted in no further investigation um, of the use or any um, complaint. There were no further complaints at the site. Um, that's really the only reason that I can provide at this point to, to um, understand why we may not have picked up that the um, use didn't have development approval um, was because the complaints were specific to a noise issue um, that was addressed by the applicant. Um, through you to you, Mayor, um, and back through the administration. Thank you for that um, response. Um, it's up to the administration how they run these matters. I don't believe that's good enough. Um, I do believe that if we have a complaint that we go into an environment where we understand what it is we're looking at, um, that we understand the context that the complaint has been made. And personally, I would have thought that knowing what the non-compliance of whatever business the noise complaint was made about or businesses in the vicinity, um, I personally would think that that would be a, a basic first, second or third step to know whether we're dealing with legitimate businesses. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Are there any further comments in relation to this item? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to 9.1 just so that we can then move on from planning. So um, item 9.1 is shop 20, number 148 Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne, change of use from consulting rooms non-medical to alternative med medicine consulting rooms. This is an absolute majority decision required. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved, Councillor Loden. Seconded, Councillor Buckles. Councillor Loden, do you wish to speak? Councillor Buckles, do you wish to speak? Does anyone wish to comment in relation to this application? If not, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. It was unanimous. I'm now just for the sake of ease going to move through um, in numerical order. So we're up to technical services. Um, well, there's one item tonight from Technical Services, 10.1, Hyde Street Reserve proposed extension. Any um, mover? Councillor Toppleberg, seconder, Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Uh, the reason I raise this, just in the briefing notes, it was indicated that um, the uh, current no dogs allowed is going to be changed or proposed to be changed to dogs on leash, which allows people to walk through. Um, this, that reserve is quite heavily used by people who take comfort in the fact that they can take either small children or people who are afraid of dogs in there. It's one of the few spaces we have where dogs actually aren't allowed at all. Um, and I'm not wanting to open a hornet's nest, but just to uh, flag that it is something that we will need to consider. There will be some disgruntled people in relation to it, but um, perhaps in the postscript to our uh, POS strategy when that uh, comes out, we should also be looking at spaces uh, where we can create dog-free environments for people who, for, for whatever reason, seek to be in a uh, public space but without uh, without dogs. Because I, I do know, um, I've personally been there on a number of occasions, either illegally with dog or seeing people there with dogs, uh, and people have requested quite forcefully that they remove the dog because they're there specifically for that reason. So it isn't uh, just flagging it may be an issue at this park. I think if we go out to consultation, we'll just get a barrage of both sides of why it should or shouldn't be, but just flagging that it will be an issue in the implementation of this. Councillor Hallett. Uh, just a comment that um, it's, it's nice to see this um, progress. It, it came up quite quickly um, when it, the idea first um, got brought to Council. Um, it's great that we've got some additional um, resources to go into it and um, you know, being able to reclaim uh, roads for green space is um, a wonderful thing for um, an urban inner city um, kind of area, so it's a good thing. Councillors? Um, look, I'd just add that uh, it was actually brought to us by some of the neighbourhood residents, I think it was back in 2014 when it was first raised, um, and this had the support of the neighbouring properties, which was um, really 
critical to getting the support of, of this moving forward with, with the immediately impacted residents. Just in relation to Councillor Toppelberg's question about dogs on leash, I just want to ask the director, is that really because the access, if, if dogs on leash can't enter the park, then it's going to be a long walk around if, if people wanted to take their dog. Now that the road's closed, they'd have to actually use an alternate route. So you're shaking your head yes, but feel free to speak to it if you want to add anything further. <laughs> Uh, through the chair, that's correct. They'd have to either walk down to Norfolk Street or up to William Street to avoid going through the park. And I suppose I didn't want to put people in a position where they're flagrantly going to uh, disregard the dogs prohibited sign. Yes, OK. Look, I do also take the point that this is really um, tends to be used a lot by the under fives in terms of parents and, and children. I mean, it, it potentially will have slightly different use with its expansion. Um, and I take the point about the access, but I also recognise that with, um, with the under fives and dogs, that can sometimes be um, tricky. And we, where we do have larger reserves, we do tend to fence off the playgrounds. Um, obviously, these dogs need to be on leash, so they're not. Um, it's not a dog; wouldn't be a dog exercise area. But yes, it is fantastic to see this happen, and um, it is an in-house project, and it's done relatively um, cost-effectively. And really looking forward to seeing this this develop and um, and be put in place. CEO, did you wish to say something? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, apologies for prolonging the discussion on this item, but just as a point of um, clarification and emphasis for council members that you'll note in the resolution that um, recommendation three talks about closing the road to vehicular traffic. Um, it's not closing the road reserve and amalgamating it or extending it into the adjacent um, public open space area. Um, the result or the requirement for that arises because the southern portion of what is currently road is still required to provide access to number 82. Um, so just for the purposes of formality, administrations identified the need to um, publicise and formalise the permission for dogs to still uh, traverse on leash through what is currently road reserve on the designated path. So there is, there is also some rationale behind that, not just for the convenience point of view. Thank you, CEO. Are there any further comments on this item? OK, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to item 11.2, which is the lease of 4 View Street, North Perth, to Multicultural Services Centre of WA. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Lowden, seconder. Councillor Buckles. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll get straight to the point. Um, I've got an amendment uh, around transferring uh, the rental income from this to the Asset Sustainability Reserve at the end of each financial year. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, I guess my point here is that currently our practice is that um, the rents that we get off our assets goes into general revenue and we then spend that those funds each year um, and there isn't a formal process by which that feeds back into making sure those assets are maintained. We do have an asset sustainability reserve and we do re review that each year but we don't currently have the information to know how much we need to be putting aside each year. And my sense is that even as a minimum, the, this, any rent that we are generating off our assets should be flowing back into asset sustainability. The reality is that in many cases we need a lot more than that. Um, this is a small step in that direction. Um, and so I feel that this is an appropriate way to uh, start bringing in that governance of the rental income that we generate off our assets. Councillor Murphy. Um, I don't actually support it. I was just giving you a chance to talk to it. Um, I think uh, it's a little bit micromanaging and I'd support the administration's comment. Um, thank you, Councillor Murphy, for, for that. <laughs> any further comments? Um, Councillor Harley? I have a question in regards to whether any rental income of, for example, the Depart Department of Sport and Rep building or any buildings over which we still may have a mortgage, whether rent um, in any way offsets the mortgages and whether the diversion, if you like, of the rent, how would that affect our mortgage payments? Uh, 
Uh, through the chair, um, in the case of the uh, uh, DSR building, there is a there is a substantial rent that's payable on that building, um, and there is a substantial loan repayment that's uh, payable on that building. But there's no linkage between the two, so the the rent goes into consolidated, and we have to pay um, every six months a loan repayment. So there's actually no linkage there, but it is more than enough to cover the loan repayment. Councillors, look, I'll speak to this. Look, I absolutely appreciate the intent and I do appreciate the desire to um, put money towards asset sustainability. We know that it is very much needed with our ageing buildings, all being of a similar era and state. So I do, I do acknowledge and, um, and thank the intent. What the issue that I do have is that I think that if you looked at the rent in its entirety for all of the buildings that, um, that we rent, versus the overall depreciation costs and maintenance, I would, without having that body of work being done and presented to council, I would feel pretty confident in saying that I would say that the overall costs to the city would well outweigh the rental income from those, uh, from those um, buildings. Um, I also have a bit of an issue about the fact that the council sets the budget based on revenue and um, allocates in a way that's set for this year so that if we if we make a decision such as this we really need to know how much revenue that would be flowing into the asset sustainability reserve that we haven't considered as part of our budget. So my preference is that these sorts of decisions around money going towards the asset sustainability reserve happen at that budget through that budget process at a higher level. I'm also concerned about the sheer volume of minor transactions of um, you know, minor transactions going into the asset sustainability reserve rather than looking at it um, from that more holistic um, approach. So I do, I do agree with um, the sentiment. Thank you, Councillor Murphy, um, but not, not um, the approach. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? It's not a good feeling. It happens from time to time. <laughs> We're back to the substantive. <laughs> Wear it with honour. <laughs> uh, is there any further... Okay, councillors, is there any further co um, comment in relation to the substantive? Okay, I'll put it all those in favour and declare it carried. Okay, we're moving on to item 13, uh, sorry, 11.3, termination of lease and options for future use at 245 Vincent Street, Leaderville. This is an absolute majority decision required. Do I have a mover? Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Murphy. Um, so this obviously came before us to the last council meeting and um, had, we had quite a lot of discussion um, about the options before us and um, also the money we're going to spend in trying to lease it out. Um, it is a shame that Pat Giles' um, organisation decided not to keep this lease um, for whatever reasons, but um, I note the, the recommendations that we're going to um, get somebody qualified, um, that rents, a probable rent's been roughly calculated and that we're going to spend a little bit of money getting it up to spec so somebody could actually live in it. Um, I know a lot of people who drive past that house and um, it's probably too noisy, but I know a lot of people that drive past that house and um, have said that they'd like to live in it. So I guess we'll see um, what the interest is. So um, I support the motion. Councillor Murphy. Um, yes, look, uh, I have got an amendment here I would like to move. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, uh, as you rightly stated, Councillor Harley, we have already discussed this in workshop and uh, again last month, but, and I was not going to actually move this amendment, but it kept on bugging me over the weekend, and uh, so I decided yesterday um, that I would uh, have another crack. Um, the reason being... Um, I just don't think that this is the best use for 245 um, Vincent Street. I think it's. Um, I think we can do better. Um, I think we can do better uh, either giving it 
or moving it higher up the food chain <clears throat> and giving it to a community group, um, which I would be fully supportive of, or um, potentially if the price was right and it wasn't to be uh, developed, um, selling the asset off. Um, I don't believe that it is, um, although I do believe that it is incumbent upon local government to preserve heritage wherever we can, and I think that um, this council does a pretty good job of that, and um, I'm fully supportive of that. I don't believe that we need to buy up all the heritage buildings and own them ourselves in order to achieve that. Um, so I am not um, too frightened of selling off the asset if it came to that within the right um, framework. However, if uh, my move, if my um, <clears throat> if it, if that is the um, concern of council over my amendment, then I would reconsider um, putting this amendment and... Um, Sorry, Councillor Murphy, I've just realised that you don't have a second of your amendment, but you are talking to it. Is it Councillor Buckles Sorry. is seconding? Thank you, Councillor Buckles. Um, I would consider re, uh, putting up this amendment and taking uh, striking off the sale um, option as well and just having it looking at um, expressions of interest for the space, as I do believe that it's not the greatest space. But my amendment is pretty much the same as last month. However, I have um, noted everyone's concerns and I am uh, supporting a 12-month lease to a resident um, whilst we go out for an EOI um, <clears throat> for a better use of the building. Councillor Buckles. Thank you, Mayor. Look, I completely support um, Councillor Murphy's amendment here. I think my fundamental issue is that I don't think that it is local government business to be owning property that is in a private rental market for, for housing. Um, I think we've got far better better places to use, invest our capital in, and um, if it could be sold to someone who is wanting to live in it, that would be, that would be a similar outcome to us having it and having someone live in it. Um, I just, uh, however, I do like this amendment because it also gives us the option of looking at other things to do. I, I would much rather this be leased out to a community organization or other group for lower rent than we might be able to get on the residential um, market. I'm sure we have other properties that we might be able to get more rent if we lease them commercially or, or to, on the private market than we do to other uses. So I think um, I think it's just the fact that I just don't think it's local government business to um, be owning private residential property. If it is, I've got a property going on the market at the end of this week, which um, 1905 Weatherboard Cottage that Council may be interested in purchasing. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, 1905 Weatherboard, you don't get many of those. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I don't expect Council to buy my home. I don't know that we need Just to open this Just noting that at your last meeting of Council, you have offered to sell a personal property a premium, to the city of Vincent. Is that what yeah. you're... No, that but, I mean, the, the point is I don't think that it's Council's um, job to be... Um, owning private rental properties um, and I think that this amendment gives us the opportunity to use it nicely for a year and also allows council to be more informed as to the long term use of that land without um, leaping, leaping into just um, looking at an asset sale as a knee jet reaction out of convenience. I think it will be good to test, uh, test, um, test other options for use of the site rather than just locking it in as a long term um, residential, private residential lease. Thank you, Councillor Buckles. Councillor Toppleberg? Just questions through you to administration <coughs> broadly. Um, given that there's been some discussion about concern, I mean, I, I'm quite comfortable that if our uh, MHI Category A can't protect a dwelling, then we've got some serious issues in relation to heritage, so I have no problem with us having that level of protection. But just to satisfy my curiosity, I suppose, what's the process involved in putting a caveat on the property uh, such that we could preclude demolition via caveat, which, regardless of what the MHI says, would require the removal of the caveat in order for that to happen, noting that the process by which you would remove a caveat would be a council decision, much the same as removing it from the MHI. But can I just ask, get some guidance as to what's involved uh, in that, if that was the will of council to try and protect the property further than the MHI Category A currently does? 
Um, through you, Mayor Cole, it's a relatively simple process. The caveat would probably be under one of the relevant sections of the Land Administration Act. There would need to be a corresponding legal agreement drafted um, by a solicitor appointed by the city to actually ensure that the terms of the caveat and the uh, obligations and encumbrances that run with the caveat are actually secured in the city's favour, so it would then be an absolute caveat in the favour of the city of Innes. Uh, that would run with the land, as you've indicated, until or unless a decision is made to withdraw the caveat. There would be a provision in the legal agreement that allows um, for the purposes of trading on the title, like remortgaging, etc., for the caveat to be withdrawn and then um, immediately after the transaction has occurred to be relodged, as well as a condition that requires every successive owner of, of the title of that property to also enter into the equivalent caveat with the City of Vincent. So it is a relatively straightforward process. Um, something like that in terms of um, registering the caveat on the title, drawing up the legal agreement and having that finalised um, from an administration process is something that would probably take, uh, to be generous, I'd say around two months or so. Um, I'm not sure how long it would take for lodgement and recording of that encumbrance against the title at um, Land Administration or Landgate or Department of Lands or whichever entity would then be dealing with that. Um, the only other comment that I would make is registering an encumbrance on a title affects the value of the title invariably, and so Council might just want to be mindful of that um, in that, yes, whilst on the one hand the caveat and the legal agreement would have a belt and braces type approach because it would further reinforce the provisions of the municipal inventory, um, that would have a related impact on the value of the property that Council might be able to attain, whether for lease or for um, sale outright. Uh, Councillor Toppleberg. Yep, so um, oh, in, in any event that would be a separate matter to uh, to the amendment that's, well, it may, may be for some, maybe not, but um, yeah, I, look, the, uh, I'm not a fan of the indiscriminate sale of assets. I don't think that there's any uh, need to be selling this property, but I think uh, to go to I agree with Councillor Buckles and I do note we'll be seeking uh, in the next week to uh, be listing his property on the MHI as well, <laughs> such, such that if the city was of a view to purchase it, we'd be uh, uh, suitably protected against uh, any future demolition. Um, I, uh, I just think that the idea of a residential rental with nothing thereafter uh, that doesn't sit well with me. I know that we are going to have a long-term financial plan and an asset management plan, so um, I wholeheartedly express uh, support the principle of going to an EOI, and I think that to close ourselves off to potential sale uh, would, again, whilst an interested purchaser would probably feel free to make submission uh, if the EOI asked for lease, it would be quite easy to come back into the chamber and uh, refuse to uh, address it on the basis that wasn't the council decision. So uh, for me, I'm comfortable uh, with the amendment. Um, I don't think it represents a desire to sell the property. I just think it's a uh, it's exactly what it is. We have a property that is vacant and we don't know what we want to do with it, so we're going to ask the community to tell us what's the best use and we're going to come back into this chamber uh, and decide what that is. Uh, and I am wholly comfortable that uh, uh, Municipal Heritage Inventory Category A protection uh, provides the protections that are required to avoid uh, demolition uh, of this property. And as I say, if, we, if we're not comfortable with that, we've got other issues that we need to manage in terms of policy in our MHI um, that can be dealt with separately. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't support the amendment um, on a couple of, a couple of issues. Um, just um, point two, I don't support locking in to a, min to a, a maximum 12 months, which is how I read this. I support locking in to a minimum um, 12 months um, so that we do have some longer term um, understanding. And I do also support us looking at options other than residential. There still may be community organisations out there that do want to lock in for a four or five year period even. Um, and I don't think we should be arbitrarily dismissing um, those options either. If um, um, So I, I'm happy to, to go back and uh, move another um, amendment if this one um, if this one f falls over, and I'll, I'll foreshadow that um, I would move that it be a minimum of 12 months and that we um, look at longer term leases, which may be community organisation or commercial in nature. Um, the reason why I don't support 
sections five and six. There's a couple of a couple of comments about council shouldn't be in the business of owning, um, you know, residential properties just because they're heritage. I, I get that, and I do support that principle. I mean, this was actually gifted to us, I understand, as part of the, as part of when we split from Perth. So we didn't actually, in recent time, go out and purchase this property. It was in a fairly appalling state, probably due for demolition at that time. But um, the council, um, in its view at that point, believed that it was um, a significant representation of houses in Leederville of that era. It is, despite. Mr Buckle's home and the few others dotted around Leederville, it is one of the last examples, according to our MHI um, application and all the research our officers did, um, one of the last remaining um, houses of that type and that is why so much effort went into, despite the roses apparently are not true heritage of that time, but apart from that it was restored lovingly um, to give people an example of what life was like. Um, it is somewhat of an ancient statement. If you, um, I've spoken to a number of people about this house that don't live in the city of Vincent. They know it. They drive past it. Who lives in it? I've always wanted, always wanted to live there. Um, what a cute cottage, etc. I'm not saying that that's places this in any high value. But I think it has an identity that we're not quite um, aware of at the moment unless this matter was tested in public. Um, and I believe that if we were going to be looking at an asset sale, then we do it completely up front and we put it out for public advertisement. I don't support an EOI. I think it's a, a, soft, a soft way of getting it out there um, because I ultimately do not support the sale of this property. And I was asked during the week by Councillor Topperberg what I believe the difference was between MHI and State Heritage Registers. So I did a bit of research and I rung the State Heritage Office. There is actually significant difference. Um, so the State Heritage Register, once that goes on there, if we were the supportive ac applicants, if it meets the benchmark, and my some of the research I've done on Detrove, um, which is much deeper than even the research that we submitted as part of MHI, would say that um, it probably would meet um, State Heritage Register benchmarks on a number of points, including um, social history and also some research into who lived there um, and their roles in the community. So the extra protection that it gives you is that if you were to look at this property, if you were to sell it or try and do something with it which was contrary to the, re to the state heritage um, status it had, there's a state government body that you would have to go to and explain that. So I believe that is a better protection. And see, I'll just ask you, just for the record, um, an owner of a property, so they enter into the MHI and they go into a category A. How does an owner of an MHI registered property lift that? Can they lift it? And what's the process for having that lifted? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding is that they would simply need to apply to council and a decision would then have to be made by council to withdraw that, that place from the inventory mm -hmm. in a fairly similar fashion to any decision of council to add a place to the inventory. Thank you. That was a rhetorical question for the record because that's exactly the reason why I don't believe this property is properly protected. We are the owner of a property that we may or some councillors may wish to consider selling and it is within our power to lift that MHI A category. Therefore increasing the value of the land and therefore making the property much more saleable and very, very, very enticing to a developer. There is nobody that's going to buy that house, let's be fair, to live in it unless they're putting in a lot of, um, you know, 10 inch thick glass. It's noisy down there. I've stood down on that corner and I've stood in that backyard a number of times. It is surrounded by noise and I think would be awful actually um, to, live in, to live in it long term. I think tenants will want to live in it and I think commercial people may want to use it for daytime use. My concern is we have a direct interest at some future point in selling a property with the MHIA category lifted. And a few, I don't believe that people sitting around this table tonight um, would do that. I don't even believe the existing administration would do that. But I would not be so certain about a future council or, frankly, a future administration if the dollars were right. So um, I am foreshadowing that um, 
a motion to put this house on the State Heritage Register. There's a huge amount of research on it, um, which, um, is, as I said, is much deeper than the papers we put forward to the Council at the time to have the MHI um, uh, Regist to have it listed as MHI Category A, and on that basis, I don't support any moves whatsoever to put this out into a commercial environment where we could be considering selling it. I, w I would be happy to engage in a debate if a councillor was willing to go down a formal path of a community advertisement and full community consultation so we can get proper feedback from the community about what they want to do with something which is ultimately their asset, because I think you'll be surprised at the depth of feeling about keeping that house. Councillors, any further comments on the amendment? Okay, I'll put those, the amendment. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried with three voting against. Back to the substantive. Is there any further comment on the substantive? Has anyone... Uh, no, no. I think your comments were about the. Yeah, it was on, on, the, on the amendment. Look, I, I actually very much agree with Councillor Harley's comments then, and that's fundamentally actually why I think that we should be putting more effort into finding a community organisation or other group to be into this rather than handing it over as a residential lease. Um, it's not an amazing place to live, courtesy of the traffic on the corner of Vincent and Loftus. It would be a, a difficult home to live in to be honest, um, around that corner, but someone will be free to choose to do that. But, um, but it, it, it does appear to have been a great location for a community organisation to be in, and just because someone's moved out, I'm not really certain why we are restricting it to being a residential lease. Now, I accept the administration's advice that it's a, it's a wise thing to do, and we can try it for 12 months, and we get the expressions of interest, which we've just done in the amendments, and Council of the Future will determine what to do. I must say, if we were going to sell it, though, Councillor Harley is probably right, we should lift the MHI off it before we sell it. That's a kind of a joke. No, 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 I know. But we, well, if we could make more money from it, wouldn't we? But, um, but, but um, you know, I, I think, you know, if... There is always a risk that council of a future may lift the the um, heritage rating listing on that on the house, but we haven't to date. We haven't thought about doing that to date. But I just think that um, the 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 motion as amended is a is a good motion um, and gives council a lot of flexibility into the future. Through you, chair, may I move an amendment? Sure. I wish to move an amendment on points. Um, what are now points one and two following the adoption of the amendment um, and based on some of the discussion and comments and to provide administration with more flexibility. Um, shall I read my amendments out and then see the seconder? Yes, please. Yes. So my amendment is to section one um, that we um, sorry, section. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, number two and number three. That number two, we uh, note and endorse the administration's intent to appoint a, appoint a suitably qualified and experienced agent to secure and manage a residential or commercial lease for a period of a minimum of 12 months. Do I have a seconder for this amendment, Councillor Lowden? Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, obviously, I'm disappointed that the amendment was adopted, but I believe that this um, enhances um, what it is that um, is being try attempted and some of the comments that we do need flexibility over the site. Um, I do think that if we had a, co a good commercial tenant, particularly a community organisation, I'm really, I, I would definitely think that there would be commercial um, community organisations around, that if we get an offer of a lease for five years, then I think that that may be a really good outcome. So um, that's the reason why I put them in. Councillor Lowden. Mm? <laughs> Can you read the amendment again for yep. Councillor Buckles? Um, notes and endorses have been, it should be on your screen by now, I hope. Com notes and endorses administration's intent to appoint a suitably qualified and experienced agent to secure and manage a residential or commercial lease, I guess you could read that as community, for a period of a minimum of 12 months. Yeah. I I'm happy to yeah. correct that amendment yeah. and amend yeah. the amendment 
and have commercial or community. I, would, I thought they're probably the same in the in the letter of the law, but. I note that that's just been changed now to read commercial or community lease for a period of a minimum of 12 months. Are you happy with that wording? Yes. Yes, so we have a mover and a seconder. Councillor Loden, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support the amendment. Uh, that gives greater flexibility on how this is delivered. Um, and I think it's going to take us at least 12 months to figure out what we want to do going forward with this so we can then see where we're at at the end of that period of time. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, yeah, so I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Loden, but I think he's got it backwards. This actually means we don't have 12 months. This means the administration has to go out without an EOI and find a tenant to sign up for more than 12 months. So to me, the whole point of the original or the amended, without this amendment, we're going to get some income off for it for 12 months. The easiest road home is to have a residential lease. And whilst that's happening, we're going to go to an EOI to see what the best use for it is, presuming we'll get a report back that talks about community or commercial lease for a period of time. If we approve this amendment, we are saying to administration, without community discussion or otherwise, go and find us a residential or commercial or community use, and it has to be for a minimum of 12 months. I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Loden. It'll take us 12 months to be able to get that proper feedback. So I actually think, whilst the intent is clear, it's actually doing the opposite of what it intends to do. And the 12-month period that was initially proposed actually gives us the opportunity to get the right tenant in there longer term. So I won't support the amendment. I think that it's, it, it undoes the intent of what the amendment actually did, which was getting the best use for the building. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, thank you. Yes, in short, I concur with um, Councillor Toppelberg's summation of the, the effect of this amendment would be as Councillor Toppelberg has just described. So may I raise a question? So currently it reads that it is manage a residential lease for a period of 12 months. So the, the original one, I'm surprised no one raised this um, objection earlier actually, the point to the original one had no time limit, a month, three months, six months. We then moved to 12 months and the amendment seeks to add in a minimum of 12 months. Can you explain why that is not, can you, are you able to articulate more why the amendment which was accepted says for a period of 12 months and the amendment says minimum of 12 months. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I can. I can um, track the impact of the various rec or the recommendation and the amendment that you've referred to. Mm -hmm. So the officer recommendation was very simply and cleanly to advertise and make available the property for a residential lease, period. And that was it. Um, the amendment imposed the 12 month lease duration for the residential tenant so that it prescribed it wasn't to be six months, it's not 13 months, it's not 14 and a half months, it's 12 months. So it is a one year residential lease of the property and in the meantime progressing with an expression of interest process. The adding of the words a minimum period of 12 months means it has to be not less than 12 months. So it could be 10 years, it could be two years, it could be 12 months and one day. Um, but it must not be less than 12 months and it could be for the purposes of either residential, commercial or community, but not less than 12 months. So my um, question is then, does that mean that in, in securing an agent to go and find a tenant for this, that we will not be seeking any tenants, commercial, community or residential that wish to lease this property out for longer than 12 months. No matter what, we don't want to lease it out for longer than 12 months. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, it depends on then which wording we're talking about. So if we only look at the amendment that's currently been adopted, the intent of that, or the, the effect rather of that, is that we will go to an agent, we'll get a residential lease for only one year. Not more, not less, just one year. Um, if the tenant who um, occupies that property decides to break their lease for less than one year, then there are provisions under the Residential Tenancies Act that will effectively deal with that. But what, will we, what, would, what the agent would be appointed to do is to get a residential tenant for a one-year lease option. Um, 
The amendment that uh, you have moved and Councillor Lowden has now seconded would then require sorry, just, us... Sorry, just before we get to that, just a point of order, just a point of clarification perhaps. Simultaneously, anyone wishing to lease the property for a greater length of time who was commercial, community or otherwise would have that opportunity at the cessation of that 12-month lease period. So it's not to the exclusion of... It's only saying that that residential lease is for a period of 12 months, but there will be a report to Council whilst we are actively seeking other uses, which includes community and commercial uses, for potentially longer periods, and that report would come to Council at some point, presumably within the, uh, within the duration of that lease. Is that correct? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, in essence, I can't predict what Council might do after that 12-month period, but what I expect Council of the day would do is, at some time prior to the expiry of that 12-month period, would consider the responses through the EOI process that would be available for um, all categories of use, companies, people, community groups, etc., to express an interest in that property for whatever purpose they so desired. That information would then be presented to Council and Council could determine the fate of the um, use or ownership of the property beyond the 12-month residential um, lease term. Um, Chair, through, um, through you, Chair. So can I ask a question about then when the commercial um, real estate agent goes and finds a tenant, does that lease offer come back to council or does administration just tick or flick it? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding of the recommendation as amended would be that that would then be dealt with by administration in the range that was proposed or set out in the officer report. So, if, yes, if I can um, add some clarity. So certainly in terms of a residential um, lease or rent, that's an exempt disposition. So. Um, that was the intent. We'd go out and get an agent and we would vet, um, based on the agent's views, the um, residential tenancy request and we would enter into that administratively. We'd be able to approve that. I, I should add the recommendation or the amendment that is currently um, being proposed, We, the city, there, there is a problem with this amendment in that um, a commercial lease is a um, non-exempt disposition depending on the time frame of it and therefore we would have to bring that back to council so I have a problem in terms of actually enacting this. Similarly a community lease depending on the nature of that entity that might also be not an exempt disposition and therefore it also need to come back to council so we have um, you know, the implementation of the recommendation as it or, as, or the amendment as it currently stands is problematic in terms of its introduction. We'd also have the question about whether we would need to spend $7,700 fitting a kitchen if it was going to be a um, commercial or a community lease. Chair, um, uh, some other points of clarification. So I just want to understand the process. So um, thank you, Director, because I'm aware that commercial and community leases do come back to Council. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing, actually. I think we get more right than we do get wrong, but that's, be that as it may. I just want to understand the process. So there'll be a whole, potentially, the agent may get a number of options for us, and we would say no deal on anything more than 12 months, no matter what. So I just want to understand, and because this is the purpose why I moved the amendment, so that we could set some minimums in place, no matter, and also get a greater body of clients, no matter what, we will not look at anything more than 12 months. Sorry, no matter how good it is, no matter what the price, no matter who. So I just want to understand, nothing will come back to council. So with this amendment, if accepted, the lease offers would need to come back to council for consideration. So we would have some say in that. So we would get to see the full range of what's been offered and at that point we could bring forward the process that we were going to do in 12 months um, and we could then, if I'm right, make a decision then about a long-term future use of that property. 
through this process now if this amendment is accepted. Have I understood that correctly, CEO, that if this is accepted, the lease offers will come back and that the agent will have more flexibility to look for other types of clients which may give us a longer term proposal if and so another point of clarification in terms of process and procedure if the amendment goes down we are locking in to residential offers only that cannot go 12 months in one day that's it okay um through you, Mayor Cole, just dealing with the first question about what would or would not need to come back to Council, uh, for the reason that Director Corporate Services advised earlier, in essence, whatever is not exempt would need to be dealt with and determined by Council. Um, my inclination from an administrative point of view, notwithstanding any authority that might be delegated through this resolution to administration, my inclination would be to bring back to council anything that the agent was able to find, given that you're now talking about three different genres or categories of potential users. And within each of those categories, there might be multiple bidders who have an offer presented to that agent, which council might then want to consider. So unless there are um, much clearer terms in, t in relation to the thresholds that council would be prepared to accept for the lease of that property for each of those different categories of users, my, as I said, my inclination would be to bring it back to council because there is not sufficient clarity and direction in, in what would then be provided to give me the confidence to enter into a lease and believe that um, what has been entered into is what was council's will. Through you, Chair. So can I just clarify, that's only if the amendment gets up. If the amendment doesn't get up, it's up to administration. You will only be able to entertain residential in accordance with the amendment we've um, we've um, accepted, and only sorry, in accordance with the amendment we've accepted, and only for 12 months. If the amendment goes down, it's over to admin to do you know what you need to do in terms of getting that rented to a resident. If the amendment goes up, it will come back to council for consideration. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, yes, as I said, my inclination would be exactly that, to bring it back to Council, because in my view, I wouldn't have the confidence to enter into a contract or a lease over the property because I don't feel that there's sufficient um, direction and guidance being provided through the current wording that would give me the confidence to, to believe that the lease that's been entered into is whatever the will of Council is. Sorry, um, Chair, just to clarify, do you mean the current wording on the substantive that's before us as amended or the current wording of the amendment? Through you, Mayor Cole, the current wording of the amendment that's on the table at the moment. I just want to ask a question because the current wording with the, with the amendment before us states that a suitably qualified and experienced agent to secure and manage a residential lease would then be a secure um, secure and manage a residential um, or commercial or community lease. Um, I think that this wording would also need to change. Would it not need to be that the agent would recommend a residential, etc.? Because otherwise, um, the decision that council will be making would be to allow that engagement to, to happen without it coming back to council, if that's the intent of the amendment. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I agree. Councillor Harley, would you like to amend your wording? It's a suggestion only um, to, um, to an agent to recommend, delete, to delete the word secure and manage and to recommend. Would you like to put that forward as part of your, your amendment? Then perhaps we could just seek some feedback from the Director of corporate services about whether that would satisfy his concerns about um, going down this path. I'm happy to have those words excised. They've, they have been in for two council meetings, so it's good you picked it up, Mayor, um, and I'm, so I'm very happy to have them taken up. Councillor Lowden, you were the second. Are you happy to have this wording? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's getting complicated. Um, 
through you, Mayor Cole, Sorry, I would can I, say... Can I ask a question of the CEO? What's... Because no one's spoken about it. What's the impact on... Um, of the amendment on Clause 5? What's the EOI for if we're going to outsource the, that process to an agent to effectively go and find a tenant? What What is... I understood the intent to be council managing an EOI process while something else was going on to secure some latent income over a defined short period of time, relatively speaking. This actually seeks to, in my understanding, subvert that process and give an agent the complete control over that process to seeing what the recommendation, up, up until the point of recommendation to council, as to what the best use is for the property. Cause it, what happens to Clause 5 if this, is, if this gets up? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, my view is, for the reasons that you've expressed, it becomes quite redundant because there is no point, in my opinion, in proceeding through an EOI process when you've engaged a real estate consultant to effectively do the same on Council's behalf. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, I'd also just add, in terms of the existence of the words secure and manage in the recommendation of staff for this report, as well as the report presented to the preceding council meeting, um, there is no error or fault in those words being included in recommendation two of the admin recommendation because they were appropriate and fit for purpose for what admin was recommending at the time. The recommendation, though, now is morphing into something that makes those words um, difficult to still remain in that position. Can I just ask an additional question um, through you to the Director of um, Corporate Services, what would be the financial implications for the city of expanding the remit for the agent beyond just a residential? Through the chair, um, one would expect that if you're going to appoint an agent, they, their fees will be based on the um, likely lease that's going to be entered into. It would be a percentage, so um, it's likely to go up but again it would depend on um, the term of an, a, a lease that might ultimately be um, recommended. The whole arrangement has morphed into something quite different from what it was and so we would therefore have to determine whether an agent is the appropriate way to secure a community group. Um, it, it would be the appropriate way to secure a commercial and it certainly was the appropriate way to secure a residential. So it, it is, um, we would need to look at how we might manage the ultimate resolution that comes out of this meeting. Any further comments, Councillor Lowden? Have you spoken on the amendment? Um, on the previous look. So, no, technically not, but you can ask a question. Councillor Murphy. Yeah, I haven't spoken on this amendment yet. Um, I don't support this amendment. It's watering down outsourcing and hurrying an EOI process that would have given Council and admin 12 months to work through um, a conversation direct with our community, um, and so I won't be supporting it. Councillors? Um, look, I... I apologise for my intervention. I was trying to assist, but I do think that this is a very difficult amendment to put up at this um, and for it to actually um, satisfy the processes that um, we need to go through as a local government. Um, the, the original intent was to go to uh, rental to provide a better income stream to, um, to the council. Um, given our experience with re leasing on a community basis, it does tend to be lower and the, the, the um, example of the existing leaseholder Pat Giles was that it was significantly lower and wasn't really meeting the costs of depreciation and maintenance and that this was a way of having a holding pattern um, and making the building effectively pay for itself while um, a broader decision could be made about the building going forward. Um, originally when we spoke about this last month, my concern was that I'm really hoping to get this body of work on all assets across the City of Vincent. Um, after a bit of question and answer on that one, it does appear that that is still some time away. So I can understand why some council members might wish to, 
test the market, certainly um, support testing the market for lease in this way. And I think that the intent was that that, that process did not um, mean that we had a lengthy process where the building was effectively vacant and not paying for itself. So I do appreciate, um, Councillor Harley, the intent to open this up early, but I think that it's it's um, a difficult one to do on the hop, and I think that the 12 months rental would really then allow time for a considered um, approach where um, where definitely people who wish to lease, whether they're commercial or, or um, community, would be able to express interest. And then in the meantime, the 12 months allows for the um, building to pay for itself and for the kitchen to be economically viable and hopefully a good addition to the to the building. So on, on this basis, I'm, I'm not able to support the amendment. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare it lost. We're back to the substantive. Chair, I have another amendment. Yes. Um, so looking again at um, clause three, uh, sorry, clause two. Um, so at the moment it says notes and endorses, et cetera, et cetera. So understand that that um, amendment with the 12 month time frame in it has just been voted down. I'd like to move an amendment that um, adds in the words, uh, sorry, remove, removes the words um, to, uh, sorry, to appoint a suitably qualified and experienced agent um, to secure a residential, commercial or community lease for a period of 12 months over 245 Vincent Street. Without the words minimum. So it's um, Councillor Harley, can you just read back again what Clause 2 would say? Notes and endorses administration's intent to appoint a suitably qualified and experienced agent. Um, I'm assuming they do need to secure, so I was actually quite comfortable with that word, but to um, secure um, and recommend a residential or commercial or co residential, commercial or community lease for a period of 12 months. Is there a seconder for this amendment? Councillor Hallett. So just speaking to that amendment and um, listening to some of the um, answers that have been given, if I've understood the spirit of what people were talking about as well, um, we do want flexibility. Um, people are committed to having 12 months after which time there would be um, hopefully a fully public EOI. Um, but what we want is we want maximum flexibility for an agent to bring to us the best tenant we can secure for that period, um, for, that, for that 12 months. And that best tenant may be a pop-up commercial, it could be a community organisation, it could be the leadable connect group, who knows who may be interested in it, but I don't believe we should limit it just to residential. <coughs> and that's why I'd like to move the amendment and I hope it's supportive. Councillor Hallett, are you seconding? Yes. Um, I'm seconding. I'm, I'm not sure that I support um, the amendment, um, pretty much for the reasons that we were talking about the previous one, um, just the simplicity of an agent focusing on a residential lease um, just for the meantime. Um, I think is a, an easier option and, um, and, and simpler to um, get that locked in and um, some income coming back from um, the lease. Just a reminder to council members that if you don't support an amendment, there's no obligation to second and then the amendment will fall. So just please bear that in mind. Any further comments on this item? I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare it lost. Back to the substantive. Any further comments, Councillor Buckles? Um, I'm pretty sure that you have spoken on the substantive. I think, did you speak to the amendment and then we went back to the substantive? <laughs> this has been going on for some time. It's hard to keep track. Um, you, are you confident? Okay, all right. So look, what I'd just like to say is that, is that actually 
And look, this is my last council meeting, so I won't get a chance to have a second bite of this cherry when it, come, when it comes back in the future. But it, it does strike me as very unusual that when we have community-oriented buildings that lease out to community organizations and then that lease comes up, we just go out and find another community organization and we give that a good crack of the whip and then we'd say, we haven't found anyone, what are the other options? The fact that our first option is to want to renovate it as a residential property and then seek EOIs, it, it, I think the thing is it raises to me a flag that, you know, and council's intent may well be to sell the property, but, you know, we seem to be going through a process of preparing ourselves to sell the property rather than going through the process of, of trying to find out if there is a community use for this building, which, which is on our MHI and is a lovely heritage building that we'd like to keep. Um, so I guess, you know, ultimately, uh, at the end of it all, I, I guess we know, I don't really know why, our, why we aren't just trying to find a new tenant for the, for the building to replace the tenant that we've lost, who were a good tenant and seemed to occupy the building in a way that was, that was appropriate. Now look, you know, I'm in, generally in favour of reasonable disposal of assets for which we don't have a use, but I do feel that we're jumping the gun in prepping it. We're almost pump priming us for sale. Um, through the renovation, and while, while I do normally support the the um, the motion towards us, I think that actually, if we were going to look for an amendment that I might consider supporting, and I'm not going to move it, I don't know, Ros, Councillor Harley has already put a few forward that she's fell with. But if it was, you know, if it, you know, if I, I, I don't see enough content in the actual guts of the, the, the officer report that explains why we're not just trying to find another lease for this rather than just saying, oh, this one's failed and there don't seem to be any on our books. Why, you know, and, and those needs might not need it to have the money spent on it. And I, I appreciate that we'd like to get some cash back, but you know, that's not our line of business. So again, I actually think we, you know, we either dispose of an asset you know, it's, not a, it's not a decision that takes 12 months to figure out whether we need a building and whether we should sell it or buy it. We either, we either want this building in community use and we find someone to use it as community use or we sell it. They're, they're pretty too simple. All we're doing is faffing around for 12 months while we, while we either sell it or we, or we don't sell it. That's, that's my ultimate thought on, on this. There you go. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Buckles, just in response to that, it's to sell the, the advertising of the EOI is to sell for sale or lease. Through you, Chair, yeah. I have an amendment. Yes. Um, I'm going to give it another crack and let's see how it goes. Uh, yep, that's right. <clears throat> so I wish to move <clears throat> what has now become um, Section 5 in the substantive and I wish to have the words, um, um, the words sale and or deleted as well as the word and ownership. And then on section six, I wish to have the words um, including sale and the word or deleted. Do I have a seconder for this amendment, Councillor Buckles? Councillor Hulley? Yep, I will speak to it, although it's probably fairly obvious what I'm trying to achieve. And I, th I had thought that at our last council meeting, there was a bit of a spirit towards that. We have an MHI, um, A category building. Um, there was a general view that we would not wish to sell it. Um, understanding that at some future point, a future council may wish to. And what came before us was the end of one lease and what was being sought was another lease and I would hope that that would be residential, commercial um, or, uh, or community, a community hub, whatever. Um, what this has turned into is just residential and quite a bit of discussion about potential disposal and potential sale. And I'm not saying that that should be ruled out altogether. Um, I'm saying that it should come to council as a standalone item and I do think it, we should not pick and choose as these properties um, come up for lease. Tonight we've just approved um, the lease of what is essentially a house um, in North Perth 
to the Migrant Resource Centre, um, we have many other properties that, frankly, I think we should sell. And I'd strongly advocate um, that we sell some of those buildings when and if that full review comes up. And I do believe, as a city, we do need to review all of our assets. And I do think we need to make some decisions, some tough decisions, about what we do need to keep, what we ourselves can repurpose into a community asset, and ones that we're going to be really brave on and create um, green spaces which will be sorely needed um, in the City of Vincent in the short and um, long-term future. So I don't, didn't believe that the intent when this came to Council the first time was for us to look at selling this property. I believed it was about securing a good tenant for that property and I believe that by the deletion of these words from the substantive we achieve what it was we were seeking to achieve. Councillor Buckles. Um, we, there's no amendment to number two on it, is it? There, so we're still going out for a residential lease. Yeah. That's the current state of si the situation, yes. Open to further amendments, though. You know, you could go all night. Could well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, well, I don't think, you know, it all depends well, on the wording of the whilst the secondary is pondering, I'm happy to say. No, 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 I'll go into it. Look, no, I'm this. sorry, I'm waiting for the second to speak. Amendment. I support this amendment, thank you. Thank you. The second it doesn't, you don't have to, have to wait for me on an amendment, though. <laughs> She's <fine>. right. <laughs> thank you, Councillor okay. Topperberg. So, so I've sat here when this came to us at the briefing and then to the council meeting and then to the briefing again and now to the council meeting. There is no appetite to sell this building and the only people who've brought up that discussion in my reading of it has been Councillor Harley, Councillor Buckles most recently and Councillor Murphy who uh, mooted that he uh, wished to potentially seek EOIs for sale and the reason that we spoke about potentially not closing ourselves off to that is perhaps the best community use would be an organisation that wished to purchase. Just to provide an example, Leaderville Connect turns around and says, I want to buy the building off the city of Vincent for $1, but we will commit to X, Y and Z going forward. We may well choose that as, yeah, caveat on the property that it can never be demolished, 100% responsibility for maintenance of it or otherwise, but Leaderville Connect to be housed there forever, as an example. That may well be something that Council considers, but under the resolution without the word sale in there, that's not something that's possible, and organisations that may pursue a path like that would be excluded from that process. So my reading of what was here... Uh, and I, Councillor Buckles mentioned we're just faffing around while we look at, at selling the building. It's quite the opposite. I think administration has Excuse rightly... Excuse me, don't say faffing around. He did. I quoted him. <laughs> Those were the exact words just that were used. be respectful to Councillor Buckles on his last Those were meeting. His right, exact please? words. It was a direct quote. It was an exact quote. It was a direct quote. So administration has noted that previously... Uh, in these sorts of circumstances, a building would sit dormant because by the time we went through an EOI process, came back to council, what about this, what about that? It probably would take a period of 12 months. So I looked at the option of leasing it for residential purposes and getting a workable kitchen as a completely separate line to what we're actually doing with the building, which is finding the best community purpose for it. Now, the fact that that may open itself to somebody coming and putting an offer of sale in front of us is in no way being invited by the council or mooted or, or, or anything other. The idea that it's going to... No one has mentioned anything about removing it from the MHI. I think it's quite clear the value that it has uh, to the community and to the council is in there, and I just think that it is simply being commercially astute as the custodians of the property and our finances to say we're going to go through this process and get the best possible outcome going forward, and likely, given the current makeup of council, uh, and potentially uh, over the next over this period of time, the likelihood is that it'll end up being, I would imagine, as a community use. This, to me, as the current substantive stands, is the best opportunity of achieving that, but prudently allows us to get some level of income whilst we're doing it. I, 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 I can't actually see what the problem is, and I do take exception to the representation that this is somehow some, something subversive that we are trying to sell the property. There is no intent to do so. It is acknowledging that we will take at least 12 months to get the best outcome for it, and whilst we're doing it, we're going to allow it to be the simplest path, which is just to have 
because it doesn't need to come back to council, someone will go out there, get a lease, and it'll be done. It'll come back in 12 months, or hopefully within that period, with us assessing the results of uh, five and six. So I'm perfectly comfortable with the officer recommendation as it currently stands. The only thing I will ask is to the Director of Corporate Services, um, will uh, Clause 3, will the upgrade to the kitchen happen immediately uh, in the expectation that a residential tenant will be uh, will, will require it, or will that only be done in the event that a tenant is found? Through the chair, uh, with the current substantive recommendation, it would be our intent we would go straight out and uh, fit out the kitchen. Councillors, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, I agree with um, Councillor Toppelberg. Um, I don't believe that we're priming this property for sale. Um, you know, further to what Josh said, uh, you know, my intent is is to bring all the information to Council with with this amendment that we can make a proper informed decision. I don't think that we should blinker ourselves in uh, or um, jumping at shadows um, thinking that um, it means anything else other than we will have all the information um, at our disposal to make a proper informed decision, the, f the true value of the property, um, full, uh, full options on what, what groups would be interested in making a proper use of it, um, and we will make a decision based on those values. I'm not frightened that this council um, will sell it to a um, developer, and I think that going through this process will give us the best outcome and our community the best outcome based on we will be fully informed. Councillors. I'd like to ask a question, if I could. That's a question through you to either the CEO or the, the director. To their knowledge, has council ever had a community lease on a building come up and where instead of going out to another community lease and seeking a community lease, we've decided to renovate the building and rent it out for 12 months on a, on a residential basis while we think about what we're going to do with it? Or, this might sound like a rhetorical question, but I just, I'm wondering, is it common practice to rent something out as a residential property whilst trying to think what we do with it? Because normally governments just would go, we would not have two, we I would not have we've three. I think have got the question. I think um, yeah. perhaps if we can go to the Director of Corporate Services who can talk through, I mean, it's sort of contained in the body of the report, the discussion around income um, and the fact that you know, this was about making it pay for itself while a broader discussion was had. Director, do you wish to add to that? Uh, through the Chair, um, that's correct. It was essentially an expediency. Um, it was an opportunity, a, a relatively simple opportunity for residential zoned land um, that is a house to be readily converted um, through the use of a, a kitchen installation and we could get a um, you know, a, a resident, um, a renter in there relatively quickly. It was a, an expediency um, to, as a holding pattern, essentially. Councillors? Can I just ask a further question, repeat to the CEO? In the absence of, as Councillor Buckles has alluded to, uh, uh, two and three, what would be, if, if, if two and three were to be, were to be uh, two, three and four, were to be deleted, what would you estimate would be the length of time before there was a suitable uh, occupant to the property? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, it's a little bit of a challenging question to answer only because it depends on the nature of the occupant and whether it's exempt or not, but um, those kind of semantics aside, um, I would estimate that you're looking anywhere from 6 to 12 months, realistically, and acting reasonably, because even if we wanted to um, go through that process with a community group, um, we would first have to embark on the EOI process. There is likely to be more than one community group that's interested. The terms that they might be offering might not be agreeable to Council, um, so there would be some negotiation occurring. And um, as Council members would be aware from our other experiences, that, that process alone can take months to just negotiate agreeable outcomes that are satisfactory to both the city as well as the um, prospective tenant. Um, I would also just add, as a point of clarification in relation to Councillor Buckle's earlier question that um, under these circumstances, a range of options has been presented to Council in the report, 
the option that administration has recommended, as uh, the director has just stated, is um, relatively low-hanging fruit because it's um, quick and easy in terms of expediency. It's also worth noting that um, the exec team also inspected the property to assess it for um, fit for purpose and usability for um, percolating City of Vincent staff or a service unit into that building to reduce the burden of um, extra work and fit out being done in this building and to prolong the life of this building um, to you know, accommodate the staff that are based in this vicinity. But it's simply not fit for purpose for, for our use because it is at its essence a home. It's not an office and would need quite a bit of converting in order to function as we would require it to function. So all of those investigations and assessments were done prior to administration reaching this recommendation. Thank you. Are there any further comments on this amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. We're back That's to the substantive. I have an amendment. Oh my Quick goodness. No, just for item six. Oh my goodness. It's for item six. It's just to include the words that can allow six. the presiding member to rule out amendments. It's at the end of item six, <laughs> just, uh, at the end of item six to be no later than uh, June 2018. Just means that we go through that process so we don't sit back here in 12 months saying we've got to roll the residential lease over again because we haven't completed the EOI. So it requires that to be undertaken in the next eight months. So six would just say no later. The report is to be submitted no later than June 2018 and just ask the CEO if that's reasonable or if you're looking for another couple of months. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, so just to be clear, you'd add, and for, for um, Emma's um, clarification, recommendation six would then read, notes a report will be submitted to council and then insert the words no later than June 2018, um, then it would carry on as written. Um, I think that's completely reasonable and appropriate. It provides sufficient time for us to go through EOI process uh, through the various parts of administration, whether it's corporate services, community engagement, planning, etc., um, to assess the different options that might be received through that EOI process and then consolidate them in a report to Council by June next year is, I think, completely fine. Councillor Murphy, are you seconding the amendment? Thank you. Um, any further debate? Just very quickly, I think the critical thing is that regardless of what the nature of the residential lease is secured by number two or otherwise, and even if it takes us a few months to do it, it means before the expiration of that residential lease in the first instance that we'll have the information before us and have had time to consider it, and by that timeline even consider it, defer it, get it to a workshop and back again if that happens to be the way that the Council of the Day decides. I have a question in regards to the officer's comments um, in regards to an EI process and meeting section 3.58 of the Local Government Act. So are you able to run us through um, the EOI process and what we would have to do to satisfy 3.58? So my question is in two parts. Could we run an EOI process without going out to a full advertisement or in order to have a sale of a property, which is ultimately what we could be talking about, come before council, would we have had to go out for a full advertised process to meet the requirements of the Act? Uh, through, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the Director of Corporate Services may wish to add to this, but um, the short of it is that the EOI process would not satisfy section, the relevant section of the Act for disposition of the property um, in the manner that you've described. So my question um, through you, Chair. So if the EOI report, I'm just wanting to understand the process we're going to go through in June 2018, which is a bit sooner than I thought it was going to, but um, so given that we've got such a short time frame, when this report comes to Council, if the EOI, um, the, I guess, feedback that will be um, brought before Council, just for example, if the community says, yes, sell that, House, what's the process we would have to go through after that in order to satisfy 3.58 of the Act? Through the Chair, in the event that the uh, proposal that Council chose is the most advantageous, 
was not exempt, so if it was sell the land, or it was lease the land to a group that is not one of the exempt criteria, then um, under Section 3.583 of the Local Government Act, you would need to, as a bare minimum, advertise the proposed disposition for a period of at least two weeks in um, a local newspaper and um, receive invite submissions, receive submissions, assess those submissions, consider those submissions, and then and only then make a formal decision. Sorry, just one last question. Approximately how long does that process take through you, Chair? Through the Chair. So um, normally that would take in the order of, um, certainly you wouldn't be able to get it back to the next meeting cycle, so you'd hope to get it to the subsequent meeting um, afterwards. So a, a couple of months in that respect. Okay, we're on the amendment, and I'll go to the seconder, Councillor Murphy. If you haven't spoken yet, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, no, I just uh, I support the amendment. I think it gives us um, plenty of time to finalise. Any further speakers on the amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour, declare it carried. We're back to the sub oh, sorry, um, Councillor Harley voting against. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comments, or can I put this item? I've I think got a right of reply, Chair. Yes, you've got a right of reply. So Councillor Harley's about to use her right of reply, which means no one else will be able to speak here on after. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but there's been a few comments made which are incorrect, and I need the record absolutely corrected on this. Um, I didn't raise the issue of sale. It was raised in the officer's report on page 152 of this agenda and a different page number, number of the last time it came to Council. I have never in my time living in this area even considered that that house would be sold by the council because I understood the history of it. So just for the record, um, because it was raised by Councillor Toppelberg, it wasn't me who raised the sale. It was absolutely the officers and I have, um, I did raise um, issues at the last council meeting. Um, I raised the issue because in the body of this report it started referring to sale and what I thought we had been dealing with was the release of a property, just like every other property, where we've lost a tenant and it comes back before council and we, we secure another tenant. This is an anomaly, absolutely an anomaly, to see us having a debate about the potential sale. And make no mistake, it's, about, it's been about half of our time that we've been debating this. We've been discussing the word sale, disposition, and we've just been outlined how section 3.58 what we would have to do to satisfy that part of the Act to go out and to advertise that to secure a, um, a, a non-exempt tenant or to sell. It's not me who raised this issue of sale. And furthermore, it's this amendment by Councillor Murphy, which, which has been accepted and voted on by every councillor except me, I believe, um, maybe one other, that has absolutely put sale squarely on the agenda for this council. Just to and clarify, the were three voting three. against thank the you. amendment. Well, thank you to those councillors who did that, but I accept that it is now the substantive motion. Um, I've made several attempts at amending this to capture the intent and the spirit, which a number of councillors have said they have no intention of selling, and yet those amendments weren't supported. Um, I, so just for the record, I would have been very happy for the word sale and disposition of this property never to have been raised. It's in the body of the report. I wrote to the um, email and with respect he replied to me saying no, I couldn't alter the body of the report and I accepted that advice. I don't understand why the disposal of the land was included in this report whatsoever. Um, we were meant to be considering a lease and now we have a motion on the books which I will have to support because I support leasing of the property. My, my heart tells me to vote against it because about half of this motion is not something that I actually believe. Um, but be that as it may, when this comes up in June 2018, I'm going to remind all the councillors who said this was not about sale of tonight's discussion. Thanks to the live audio and the bookmarking, we'll be able to do that a bit easier, I suggest. But I'm also not going to give up on this house. And I am foreshadowing that I will move a motion to have this home put on the State Heritage Register because I believe this council has a direct conflict of interest in lifting the MHI Category A if at some future point we get an offer of purchase 
where the MHI category A, um, if lifted, would lift the value. And it's not about lack of trust. It is not about subversiveness. It is about what could happen in the future under a different council. We're facing council elections. We don't know who's going to get um, elected. A different administration, a change of CEO, a change of spirit of this um, of this council, and that's what I'd like to protect this property from. And tonight I've partially failed, but I won't give up on it. So, just putting all on notice, um, you may or may not support a state heritage register application with this property. I really hope you do, because this was meant to be leased. We were not meant to be talking about sale, and that's all we've talked about. Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We're now moving on. Item 14.4, lease to Axiom Proprietary Limited for telecommunications purposes at Tamala Park. This is an absolute majority decision required. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved, Councillor Lowden, seconded, Councillor Hallett. Do you wish to speak to this item? Do you wish to speak to this item? Any further comment or debate? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Uh, Councillor Buckles, did you vote? Yes. Okay, thank you. Everyone voted yes in favour. Okay, um, the next item is the review of the Local Government Act submission to Welga, which is item 11.8. Um, this was raised by Councillor Lowden. Do you wish to move the item? Move Councillor Lowden. Seconded, Councillor Buckles. In the interest of time, I'll just move uh, my amendment uh, in regards to. Uh, changing item 13, 30 to provide um, an opportunity for, for Wolga to give consideration to allowing councils to differentiate between tenanted and or residential and uh, non-owner occupier and owner op occupier dwellings. Is there a seconder for the amendment? There's no seconder for the amendment, so the amendment fails. So back to the substantive. As we have the seconder wish to speak to the, or do you wish to speak to the substantive as the mover? Seconder? No? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, moving on to item 12.1. This is a sports ground fees and charges review. This is an absolute majority decision required. Do we have a mover for this item? Councillor Toppelberg seconded. Councillor Buckles was I think first. Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Buckles, do you wish to speak to this item? Is there any comment or debate? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Um, Councillor Harley, were you voting in favour? Yes, it's carried unanimously. Um, just to check, it wasn't absolute. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're now moving on to the um, item 12.2, unbudgeted capital expenditure for a digital camera for marketing and communications. This is an absolute majority decision. Councillor Hallett moved, seconded Councillor Tobelberg. Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak? It's um, a useful tool to have. It certainly is. Councillor Buckles, uh, sorry, Toppelberg. I just find it incredibly enjoyable at the uh, potentially the last item that uh, myself, Councillor Hallett, or Councillor Buckles get to speak about in open forum and capture on camera is the unbudgeted item of the purchase of a camera. I think it's the, the big issues that matter, so I'm very pleased. And um, wholly support the officer recommendation. No issue too big or too small for this council. Um, Chair, I don't support that amount of exp unbudgeted expenditure being spent on a digital camera. Um, I, um, my question is, um, were there quotes um, provided? Has there been a? This is a, a lot of money that we didn't budget for for a camera. Technology is pretty amazing, um, and I can't believe in this day and age we're paying two hundred two and a half thousand for a digital camera because I don't think there's. Yeah, anyway. Can I ask whether there were quotes and whether there was cheaper commensurate options? I'll um, ask the CEO to respond. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the procurement process has been followed exactly as prescribed under Council's purchasing policy. And the only reason it's unbudgeted in this case is because the place that the funds were, were placed by the relevant team was 
unfortunately in the operating budget rather than the capital budget. Um, so the funds do exist on budget, just not in the right place for the capital expend or for the capital purchase. And because our purchasing policy regards a purchase of this nature and scale as being capital, the appropriate thing to do is what we're recommending here. Can I just, just ask a question? It's more a curiosity, but um, I note that obviously where it says that high quality, where professional services are required, but is it fair to assume that there are uh, currently uh, situations where we are procuring professional services because of the lack of uh, a camera of this quality within the organisation? So somewhere between personal devices and professional work, this would actually fill a gap. So we should, should, should see potentially a reduction in some of those professional service fees? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that's exactly correct, and that's why it was proposed by the relevant staff at budget time. So just another to, sorry, just to add to Councillor Toppelberg's um, question, currently one of the marketing officers is using her phone, and the phone, and the, even for a phone, the quality of photos are terrible. Um, and I do understand that the new um, The new graphic designer actually does have some photography skill. My other question through you, Chair, is given that um, we have, um, a couple, I think, two local businesses, will we be looking at making this a purchase locally through a local provider? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to be sourced from, but my understanding is that um, staff have, um, have identified from quotes received, what is the most advantageous um, product and um, level of package that's going to be offered, and that's what they've sought. I don't know uh, through the Director of Community Engagement, sorry, through you, Mayor Cole, if there is any clarification as to uh, where it's intended to source that from, but um, my recollection is that the staff did actively seek quotes from businesses who can provide this type of product in the city. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, apologies. I, I um, can't recall the business uh, where the, who is the preferred supplier, but I do know that Leadable Camera House um, was one of the um, suppliers of a quotation. So certainly quotations were sought from local providers, but I'm sorry, I can't recall whether they were the preferred supplier. Are there any further comments? Can I put the item? All those in favour? All those against? It's carried unanimously. Um, that concludes the um, business um, for this evening, other than the, the confidential items for which we will um, need to close the meeting. I'd just like to make an announcement that in relation to the two confidential items, 18.2, um, which was a late report on the appointment of the Director of Engineering, is not um, on tonight's agenda. There's been a requirement for some more time to prepare that item, so it hasn't been presented as a light item and um, will be um, provided to Council as part of the special Council meeting on uh, next Tuesday, uh, the 24th, I believe it is, of October. So we'll now go in camera to consider the confidential items. So thank you for those who've joined us on the live web stream. Yes, so can I just have a mover and seconder to go into um, closed session? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? Declare it carried.